board meeting of the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians. This meeting is held on Friday, August 25th, 2017 at Hilton Los Angeles Air Airport. And we have moved from the International Ballroom to La Jolla. the La Jolla Ballroom at 5711 West Century Boulevard. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, we'd like to thank the schools who've joined us today and all other members of the public who have joined. For the sake of time, we'll not be introducing those who have signed in, but we will appreciate your presence. A part of calling this meeting to order includes the Pledge of Allegiance. Could I please ask everyone to stand and join us in the pledge as led by my fellow board member, Ken Maxey. of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So now we're at introduction of uh, board members. I'm Tammy Endozo, current board president. Will the board members please introduce themselves starting at my far left. Good morning, Donna Norton, LVN member. Good morning, John Deerking, public member. Good morning, Paul Sellers, psychiatric technician member. Good morning, I'm Bernice Bastin Martinez, vice president of the board and public member. Samantha James Perez, psychiatric technician member. Ken Maxey, public member. Cheryl Turner, public member. <coughs> They switch seats. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. At this time, I would like the interim executive officer to please introduce herself and the staff present. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Anderson, and with me today, to my left, Vicki Saavedra here at the table, Samantha Kalma. Jen Johnson, Brian Vu, our new enforcement chief, Jay Prouty, our new discipline unit manager, and to my right, the consultants, Faye Silverman is on the end, Beth DeYoung, Jessica Gomez, and Margarita Valdez. We also have legal counsel present. Would the counsel please introduce herself? Kenneth L. Swenson, Senior Staff Counsel, Counsel for the Board. The Board of Voc Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians is required to hold public meetings and make policy decisions that protect the health, safety, and welfare of California consumers. Public meeting agendas are prepared well in advance of the board meeting. Agenda requests for consideration must be clearly set forth in writing. The board requests that all items and supporting documents to be included on the agenda be received in the Sacramento headquarters by the first Friday of the month preceding the scheduled board meeting. In addition, if there are documents that you would like board members to timely review and consider <laughs> relative to an agenda item, the board asks you submit 15 copies of the document and provide the board an electronic version of the documents, preferably on CD. Please ensure that you redact any student names prior to copying information. During the meeting today, public comment is welcome on any agenda item. When the item is taken up by the board under the Bagley Keene Open Meetings Act, the board may not take any action on issues raised by public comment that are not on the agenda other than to decide whether to schedule that issue for a future meeting. If any person wishes to address the board, please come forward to the podium when called for public comment. It is helpful for the record if you would state your name and the name of the organization you represent. However, you may remain anonymous if you wish to do so. Just a reminder, please conduct yourself in a professional manner while making comments. 
I must insist that all those who wish to comment direct their comments to board members and refrain from personal attacks. We have a full agenda and in order to allow board sufficient time to conduct its scheduled business, I may limit the time given to each person who wishes to comment, generally three minutes. Please understand this is because we want to hear from everyone and give all those who wish to do so a chance to comment. I would rather hear from everyone for three minutes rather than one person for an exorbitant amount of time. Um, if you wish, it's acceptable for you to simply state that you agree with the previous speaker or you may make an original statement. If I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item, it's not because I intend to limit the comment, so please raise your hand or come to the podium and I will recognize you. The board appreciates your cooperation and assistance in meetings, its legal mandates. So general comments, I wanna make, thank, I wanna first thank the board members for their yesterday evening and the dedication to the board and your service to protection of the public. So uh, for the agenda, there no, we're going to try not to take any formal corporate breaks, although we will be taking a short break mid before, uh, after a couple hours for board members to check out. However, due to a large amount of items, we, we want to, after that, we'll take a lunch break and then just, if you need to use the restroom in between time, just... Um, get up and go. We're just going to continue um, business. I ask that um, when you do that to please be as quiet as possible when leaving the room as not to disrupt business being conducted by the board. That brings us to agenda item 12, a presentation and discussion regarding the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, I appreciate the opportunity to make a short presentation on the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Today I'll be discussing the purpose and requirements of the act and focus in on the restrictions on meetings for public bodies uh, under the act. The materials for this presentation consist of copies of a publication from the California Attorney General's <coughs> Office called A Handy Guide to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Uh, I distributed copies of it to the members of the board. There are copies available at the check-in table in the back of the room and at the podium. Additional copies um, may be obtained from the Attorney General's Office by writing or calling the public inquiry unit at the Attorney General's office. I'd like to thank my former colleagues at the Attorney General's office for their work in preparing and updating uh, this handy guide. It truly is a handy guide and I would uh, commend it for anyone that wants to uh, obtain an in-depth treatment of this subject. The Open Meeting Act is an essential part of the board member orientation training program that board members are required to complete within the first year of appointment or within one year of reappointment. So there's a lengthy set of materials that board members receive <coughs> at the board member orientation uh, training that, um, that provides a great deal of guidance as well. Uh, I'll start by talking about the purpose of the Open Meeting Act. And that's provided in Government Code Section 11120. It declares the public policy of the state and provides its legislative findings and declaration relating to the conduct of the people's business. So paragraph one provides as follows. It is the public policy of the state that public agencies exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. And the proceedings of public agencies be conducted openly so that the public may remain informed. Paragraph two of that 
code section states, in enacting this article, my article is referring to the act codified by the um, by the provision, the legislature finds and declares that actions of the state agencies uh, should be taken openly and that their deliberation should be conducted openly. The reason for this is stated in paragraph three of the statute, which reads, the people of the state do not yield their sovereignty to agencies which serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good to, uh, for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may retain control over the instruments they have created. So that, that code section declares the public purpose and intent of the Bethlehem <coughs> Open Meeting Act. The act itself is contained in government code sections 11120 through 11132. It provides a comprehensive scheme for regulating the public meetings of state bodies. In essence, it imposes three essential duties on state bodies. First of all, to give timely and sufficient notice in advance of the meetings, including a description of what items are going to be discussed. That is normally done through posting a notice and agenda at least 10 days in advance of the meeting, subject to certain exceptions. The second essential requirement of the act is to provide an opportunity for public comment. In the Attorney General's handy guide, it refers to this requirement as giving a seat at the table for the public. I also like to think of it as allowing the public not only to watch what goes on, but to participate in the presentations and deliberations being made at a public meeting, <coughs> much like uh, if you attend a movie where there is interaction uh, during the film amongst the uh, players. The uh, third requirement is that the meetings be conducted in the open and made available uh, to, for public viewing, except in uh, certain constrained uh, situations where the law allows for closed, se closed session. Um, the exceptions are extremely narrow and um, for the most part, strictly construed. So those are the three requirements. We've talked about the purpose and the re basic requirements of the act. And then I'd like to uh, today focus on um, what a meeting is under the act. And in subsequent sessions, we might cover other uh, elements of the open meeting law. Because of our time constraints today, I'm gonna focus on this. So a meeting under the act is defined as any congregation of a majority of the members <coughs> of a public body. Or a committee composed of three or more members. The law recognizes that not all gatherings of a public body in a single um, location constitute a meeting. However, current law provides that the provisions of the act do not apply in situations where a majority of the members did, do not discuss among themselves um, the business of the body. So um, informal meetings can actually become board meetings under this provision. So if the business of a body is dis or a board is discussed at a dinner, an informal dinner, and there's a a quorum present, that technically constitutes a meeting. Um, there are some exceptions, for instance, for individual contacts or conversations between board members um, in person or attendance at conferences, uh, social functions, and the like. Uh, one of the situations that um, can create problems is 
when there are serial communications uh, using technology sense, uh, such as emails uh, or telephone uh, communications where uh, the board members communicate seriatim in a series of communications, uh, a chain of communications, um, and a majority of the members participate, that can become a board meeting. Likewise, if board members communicate through a central party in a spoke and wheel type arrangement, that can constitute a board meeting. So the reason I'm discussing this is if there is a quorum, um, uh, the rules cannot be circumvented circumvented by either uh, the spoke and wheel arrangement of communicating through an intermediary or a series of communications. So with that said then, um, uh, board meetings generally require the, those three essential elements when the, uh, when the quorum is present or three or more members are meeting to discuss board business, then the three essential elements of the Bagley Kane Act must be met. That is, there must be timely, and sufficient advance notice. The public must be um, uh, allowed an opportunity uh, to comment and participate, and the meeting should be conducted in the open and available to the public. Thank you, Madam uh, President. Thank you. Any questions from board members? <coughs> Seeing none, that takes us to. Do we need to ask for public comment on this? Okay. Is there any comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item 13, executive committee report, recommendations and possible actions. The executive committee met on August 4th. On that day, um, we got updates from the enforcement monitor and um, the enforcement staff. We were apprised of the, up schedule, the upcoming schedule for board member orientation provided by our board staff to our new members. Um, we had two new members in attendance and um, the vice president was able to attend. Um, I want to thank the staff for, for doing the board member orientation. I heard that the information provided was great. Um, due to the new staff coming on board, we've also restructured or the committees. So we've, um, the executive committee remains Bernice and myself. We have the administrative committee, which we'll be hearing from later. Samantha and Cheryl. Education committee is Bernice and Ken, uh, Ken Maxey. And when we get the nurse educator, then that person will also uh, um, be on that committee. Enforcement committee is Ken Maxey and Samantha. Evaluation is Bernice and Alita. Legislation and regulation committee is John Durking and Cheryl Turner. Licensing is myself and Paul Sellers. Practice committee is Samantha and Donna. And strategic outreach is John Durking and Paula, who is one of our new board members who was not able to be here today. And let's see, we had some new staff come on board, as you heard from Cheryl when she gave staff introductions. Um, Brian Vu, the enforcement chief. Kelly Williams is a complaint unit manager. Jay Powdy is, was promoted from within to discipline unit manager. And Nicole Noah, 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 for the special investigators unit, uh, position in the investigations unit and Rochelle Johnson. Johnson for the, um, what was that? <laughs> the supervising, She's the manager. managing. 
and Bernice will give us an update on the strategic plan, the discontinuation of pocket cards and enforcement monitor update. The, the executive committee received uh, the reports and reviewed them. The enforcement committee will give further details on the enforcement monitor update and the licensing committee will give further details on the discontinuation of the pocket cards. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, regarding the strategic plan, the executive committee reviewed in detail the strategic plan and identified the goals that will be moved to each of the committees. And committees with recommendations from exec will oversee working with staff the work toward meeting the goals and the benchmarks and timing of those goals. And we will keep the public updated as to how we are moving forward in meeting the current 17-2019 strategic plan. Thank you. Any questions from board members? Any comments from public members? Seeing none. We'll move on to agenda item 14, administrative committee report. And I turn it over to Samantha. Thank you, Madam President. <coughs> um, and there was an update to our report, which was distributed um, this morning on the dais, and there is a public copy in the back as well. The administrative committee was formed at our uh, June 6th meeting, uh, meeting in Sacramento. And at that time, the board voted to authorize the uh, administrative committee with certain duties and responsibilities. We were formed by a legislative recommendation um, in our sunset um, report is why we came to be. So you can see here we um, discussed things that we did. Um, what we accomplished was we made changes to the administrative procedure manual, which um, is attached in the update. Uh, we updated the standing committee language to include um, the committee. Um, which you talked about in your executive report. And we did have one-on-one -on -one meetings with staff, and then we will be meeting again next quarter. Um, briefly, I wanted to um, go over the update. Uh, we have two updates. Uh, we met with staff on August 3rd and August 4th at uh, board headquarters um, to solicit feedback directly to staff and have them talk with uh, board members directly, um, open that channel of communication. We, we heard from a whole spectrum of um, of uh, different opinions and uh, staff members and very good variety. Um, based on those meetings that we had, uh, we actually rec have four recommendations we would like to present to the board. Um, the first one is uh, number one, uh, which you can see here, in order to help staff express themselves and achieve closure from past experiences, we recommend bringing in an independent third party counselor or other professional um, should be brought in to meet with staff who wish to debrief about past experiences. And we thought that sources uh, of support for this recommendation may include, that's up to the executive committee, DCA's health and safety department and or as employee assistance program. Um, obviously the logistics would need to be probably worked out by exec committee um, and, and staff management. Second one is per staff request in order to facilitate improved communication. Uh, we recommend the monthly employee newsletter should be restarted. Um, staff uh, requested that specifically uh, for communication and it was, uh, it was a good thing that, that we had. Staff involvement in social and or team building activities for those who choose to participate um, should be actively encouraged. And uh, we know that board committees have uh, staff assigned to them, which, which is great. Um, and we also think that uh, since most of the staff assigned to the committees are management, that uh, non-management staff um, should be invited to participate as appropriate as well. And the last uh, <coughs> recommendation we have is that all staff should be encouraged to complete training on the topic of effective, communi communic uh, effective communication <laughs> uh, for the work environment or something similar subject to availability. A uh, possible source of support for this uh, may be DCA solid training solutions. We thought that was one, one thing that might offer help. Um, do, before I move on to my next uh, update, do we have questions or discussion on those recommendations? Um, 
So um, I received advice from our legal counsel that to actually adopt these recommendations, we will need a, a vote, a roll call vote. Um, Madam President, did you want to lead the roll call vote or should I move to have a motion? I'll move to accept the recommendations of the administrative committee as printed. Is there a second? I second that. Just as a matter of procedure, Madam President, since it's a uh, committee report, is a second required? As our legal counsel has told us, there's no second required because it's coming from the committee. So let's do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Paul? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Bernice? Yes. Myself is a yes. Samantha? Yes. Ken? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Alida? Yes. So the vote is unanimous. May I continue with my report, Madam yes. President? Um, thank you. And uh, the uh, administrative committee's uh, activities will continue. Uh, we'll be meeting again and, and moving forward with, we have some ideas going forward. Um, now we are proud to announce, are happy to announce we have an update regarding the executive officer hiring process. Uh, the administrative committee is also the selection committee uh, for preliminary interviews of the new, uh, our new EO that we will be hiring. Um, the deadline for submission of applications for the posted EO position was August 22nd, so that was Tuesday. The original date was actually extended 30 days uh, due to a limited number of responses. Uh, we feel that we're comfortable now with the pool of candidates that we've received, and so we have contacted Human Resources, and in conjunction with HR, we will review the applications, and we'll move forward to schedule preliminary interviews. And Madam President, if I may just, uh, looking to the future, uh, may just want to uh, give you a heads up that the um, final interviews will need to be done by the whole board, the full board, and so that may mean us I'm thinking either calling a special meeting or having uh, at our next meeting at, at another afternoon or we will have to have some sort of an open meeting uh, and then we interview in closed session. Yes, correct? Okay. Yes? Okay. Um, so that will be uh, just a heads up to board members. Um, that will be something we might be calling for to have a meeting. And when we do set that up, we're also going to invite Dean Graffio from yes. DCA to join us in the final selection. So whatever um, you guys um, negotiate to the best uh, timing for everybody. Um, but we are actually going to be moving forward with that. Thank you for that. So as my vice president pointed out, my numbering is off. I missed a couple up in there. They numbered the roll call and the Pledge of Allegiance as 11 and 12. So I just kind of took it and went down and didn't number those. So we're actually on agenda item number 17, Enforcement Committee Report. And that was Samantha and Ken. Uh, yes, Madam President. I see that there's an A, B, and C, and that we, I believe we're going to be having some presentations. Yes. Um, so as far as the report itself, um, board members have received it um, and reviewed it. Uh, we don't think we need to necessarily go over it in detail because we have the presentations for sake of time. And then I'd like to call Brian, our enforcement chief. Good morning, members of the board. The enforcement report shows that the sixth fiscal quarter since inception of Greece with the transition from CAS to Breeze, comparing data from both systems would present inconsistent data. Do you have the Where's report in front of you? The Enforcement Committee report. Oh, the Enforcement Committee, um, we did not meet prior to this board meeting. We will um, reconvene at a later date.
I believe the enforcement report will be held at the uh, later in the afternoon. Correct. This is the one where they went to teleconference with Ken. Yes. So, Ken, this is the report on the teleconference that you guys have with Andrew when Andrew was still there. Um, would you like to give us an update on that? And then Brian will give us under Cheryl's. That's what I thought. The report, and that um, maybe if there was just any questions for sake of time, let's go into these. But whatever your preference, that would be. Do board members have any questions on the enforcement committee report? From June. From June, From June 20th. 20th. Madam President. The only question that I had regarding this um, report is since it, the report was from June, has there been any progress or any update to this enforcement committee um, to, that needed to be reported? And that's the progress and update will be in Brian's report under um, Cheryl's uh, Should we have him do it now? So we'll have him, we'll have Brian do the report now then. Oh, it, I, I'm just, I'm fine for whenever the report is going to come. I just wanted to know if there was an update from June, because according to the minutes, there was supposed to be another meeting in August. Madam President, if I may answer Ms. Norton's question. Uh, Mr. Maxey and I are here. Uh, the chair of the, uh, co-chair of the uh, enforcement committee was Andrew Moreno, um, who we know was, uh, has gone to another board. So that uh, we had created a uh, uh, stall, a little bit of a stall, because um, we had to appoint someone new, which turned out to be me. And then uh, we did not uh, have an August meeting because we were in the transition time between Mr. Uh, Moreno's departure. Um, and now we have the committee back together. We will be meeting um, next month, um, but we did not meet in August. Okay. Thank you. However, they, um there was progress done with the enforcement um, chief when he came on and Stephanie with uh, the report that Ben Franks has done. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Madam President, I failed to mention that. My apologies, Mr. Vu. We also received a new enforcement chief, Mr. Vu, who was transitioning in at the time. Um, so at the same time that we lost Mr. Moreno, we uh, received Mr. Vu. Um, so there was a uh, few transitions going on, um, onboarding and things like that. Um, but now we're, um, we have a new team back together. So, so shall we, uh, Cheryl? Yes, I have a question. Um, there is a comment about Mr. Frank's involvement in working with, uh, to assist triaging cases that are being processed. And um, since there's some new board members, I'm not sure of the exact scope of his authority. Uh, maybe that's within his authority. Um, but uh, I just had a question about that, so. So he was appointed, the, the legislator appointed Ben Franks as the enforcement monitor. Yes. So um, when that happened, Ben Franks has been in giving uh, reports. So, so far we've had, I believe it's three reports thus far. And the most recent report is what the enforcement committee was working on along with um, Brian Vu and Stephanie and that's, I believe what they're talking about reviewing these um, cases. So with that, they're you know they'll give the report of what they've done, where they're at. Um, for the, we can do the report now, or we can wait for the Cheryl's report. Would you prefer now? Yeah. Okay, let's have them do it now. 
do all the board members have the statistics and enforcement report in front of them? Brian, you'd like to? Oh. We'd like to welcome um, Jeff Mason, Stephanie, and uh, Ben Franks. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, nice to see you guys again. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Mason, the Chief Deputy Director of the Department of Consumer Affairs. I've met several of you before. A lot of you I know are, are new to the board, so welcome. And congratulations on your appointments. Um, the past few months have been incredibly active on the enforcement side for the, the Bureau, and working with the Department, with the Division of uh, Investigations, and we wanted to make sure that you guys were updated on all the, on that progress. Um, and because many of you are brand new appointees, I wanted to start out with a quick discussion, thank you for the lead in by the way, uh, on um, Mr. Frank's appointment, the enforcement monitor, where he came from, what his purpose is, et cetera. Excuse so, me. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Do, sorry, I'm just trying to catch up here. It was a really fast transition. Do we have a report for this? What agenda item is this? Because I don't have anything to refer to. 17 has some of it. But Cheryl, you said that it was sent out to 24 B's. 24 B's. Yeah. What number are we on? 24 B's. 24 B's. Some of it is. I'm sure the audience would like to carry on as well. for B as being a staffing update? No, the enforcement. Enforcement division staffing update? Part of it is under the enforcement committee's report. Sellers, did you find it? Last night. Yeah, it might be helpful. This is the report that was given out last night. It was not in our original packet, correct? No, it was. Yes. It was. No, it was. It was given out last night. Or yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So, if other board members are having trouble finding it. It would be the one that was given yesterday. Would you like me to remark while you're looking or wait a moment? Board members, you have in your packets information in terms of the enforcement processes that we are, are referring to. If you'll, you'll note uh, under agenda item 15, the executive committee meeting, section five, enforcement division issues, that's the beginning of it. Um, and that's the part that uh, discusses Mr. Clifford, uh, as well as the findings of the enforcement uh, monitor, uh, and Ms. Whitley and Brian Vu. If you go to agenda item number 17, which is where we are now, it's the enforcement committee report, which is another part of the same issue. And then item 24 is the enforcement division update. They are all part of the same process from different angles. So what we're saying is we will discuss them all at one right now so that you have a, a cohesive and clear understanding of the entire project. And Madam President, if I may, uh, because 
out of DCA. They were generous enough to bring the team so that they would speak with us with about this item all at one time. And Mr. Mason, thank you so much. Oh, of course, no, no, it's a pleasure. Great, so um, where we were discussing is um, back in 2015, uh, during the board's last sunset go around, not the current one you're engaged in, the legislature passed AB 179 by Assemblymember Mo, uh, Bonilla, and this legislation, one of the many things it required was is that the board had to engage with an enforcement monitor who would oversee the administrative and the enforcement process of the board. As part of this task, uh, the enforcement monitor is responsible for delivering four separate reports within a two-year, rough two-year period, with the last report due January 1 of 2018. Um, and it's a the board is, uh, provides the monitor with all your enforcement data, access to enforcement staff, and, they, and he does an evaluation of processes, and procedures, protocols, et cetera, and delivers the report. The report so far has been part of the current sunset process, and it's been part of recommendations made to the board to, uh, on the enforcement side. So that's the current program uh, with the enforcement monitor. In March of 2016, uh, DCA contracted with uh, Mr. Ben Frank to serve as that enforcement monitor. Um, he's tasked to once again provide those four reports, and those reports are then utilized by the legislature to evaluate the ongoing progress of the board in, in its enforcement program. In May and June of this year, the board's enforcement committee requested the monitor to work collaboratively <coughs> with board staff to review enforcement data to ensure its accuracy. And to assist that monitor in that process, a DCA assigned its division of investigation to work with the monitor on that evaluation process. Um, so at this time, I'd like to have Mr. Frank to come forward and discuss his, his latest findings during that latest period. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, good morning. My comments today focus on summarizing the major findings resulting from the targeted reviews of enforcement program statistical data and business processes that were completed during late June and early July. These reviews were completed collaboratively with enforcement division staff and the department's division of investigation. The level of cooperation and assistance that I received was outstanding and I'm especially appreciative of that support. Just to help kind of help you get a little oriented, you might want to reference before I get into my comments, um, your agenda item 15, which I think was referenced on page three at the top, there's an outline of A to F, some issues, and my comments will be paralleling more or less that list of issues. I'll give you a minute to, that was agenda item number 15, page three at the top. <coughs> the review of the board's statistical data identified more than 200 separate investigation cases containing erroneous case status tracking information that staff subsequently corrected. Additionally, significant problems were identified with the reporting of completed and pending desk investigation statistics and completed and pending subsequent discipline case statistics. These problems also adversely impact the reporting of aggregate statistical data, such as the total number of completed and pending investigations and the total number of pending and completed discipline cases. With respect to the targeted reviews of the enforcement program's business processes, the results were both surprising and alarming. For example, we found that large numbers of complaints were being automatically closed during intake without any investigation, including all complaints submitted anonymously and irrespective of the details provided or the egregiousness of the offenses. Many of these cases involve serious criminal misconduct 
or significant patient harm for which CPEI guidelines allow referral to the Division of Investigation. Additionally, most complaints received from inmates at correctional facilities were automatically closed during intake without any investigation. We also found that a large backlog of licensee complaints had accumulated in intake rather than being promptly screened and referred to either the board's special investigation section or the division of investigation as appropriate. As part of our review, we also found that licensee criminal arrest cases were continuing to be closed pending adjudication of the cases, but that the cases were not always being properly tracked to ensure the necessary case disposition follow-ups were completed. For example, dozens of these cases continue to be assigned to staff in the Breeze case tracking system after the person had transferred to another job or separated from the board. Another major problem area involved the accumulation of a large backlog of more than 100 completed investigation cases. Most of these cases involve serious criminal misconduct or significant patient harm that had been investigated by the Division of Investigation. Cases of this type that I personally reviewed involved offenses like engaging in non-consensual sexual activities with a patient, diverting and using controlled substances at a work site, and using street drugs such as methamphetamine while at work rather than being promptly reviewed and referred to the Division of Invest to the Attorney General Office to initiate disciplinary action, these cases were languishing for months with the licensee continuing to practice and in some cases committing additional criminal offenses during this period. As I have mentioned in previous presentations, earlier this year about 80 special investigation cases were closed with issuance of a NAP in some cases without first sufficiently investigating the cases. Because the board never took any action to review and where needed reopen these cases, we did so as part of our review and found that about 25% of these cases needed to be reopened and further investigated. Another area of concern involved the board's citation desk, which had not been staffed since the assigned analysts separated from the board in mid-May. During our review, we learned that issuances of citations, along with other citation program functions, were in complete hiatus. Be I'm sorry. Mr. Frank, do you have a report for us to follow along with you? There, the Department of Consumer Affairs provided the board's, I believe, executive committee with a memorandum that discusses these problems. Is, is that correct, Mr. Mason? Yes. And, uh, we have yeah, that? apparently that, so that's the status of the submission of a documentation to the board at this point, is it's with the executive committee, I believe, correct? So and, with the, and with the board's EO. <coughs> I, have, I have a copy with me, but I, don't, I have one copy that I could well, provide, or we could follow up, it, perhaps. It's very difficult for me because you're you're talking I you're talking very fast. I'll you've slow said back. things well, but you've said things that I'm like, well, wait a minute, how did that happen? And right. what are we doing about that? And what you're referring to, I have no I have no basis for um, to follow along with what you're saying. Um, it would be um, this is the first time I'm hearing that mm -hmm. there were inmate cases that were automatically closed and never investigated. So if you are going to report something to me and it is on me to follow through as this board, then I need more information than that. And there's, I, I'm sorry, I have, I have nothing in, in this packet. And I'm, you know, I'm a very organized person and I read everything before I get here. But It was my, my understanding that it was supposed to be an overview of this between Brian Vu, Stephanie, Jeff Mason, and from the report that Ben Franks had sent and the update of where they're at with those. So the now cases that he's talking about were ones that were closed previously prior to that they reopened and re-looked at and found that um, they needed to be investigated, that they weren't investigated prior to being closed. 
So, but I understand what you're saying is that. Well, when you make statements like because the board took no action, that's a very, that's an inflammatory. I didn't even know that there was an action to be taken. So it, it's concerning that inmate cases were not investigated, that um, sex was, I, and I lost that. I was like, he, did he just say what? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. if that's and factually if, correct. Yes, yeah, so like, and, and that's just you're, just, you're just saying these things and, and then following up with because we took no action. We were, I was unaware of that. So. I'm happy to go back through and um, clarify or elaborate on any of these problems. They, they basically map to this list A to F and also answer any questions that I can um, to help clarify what I'm saying. But, but um, uh, that's kind of all I can do at this point to help you understand. These, they're, these are hard-coded findings. They when? were developed in collaboration with board staff and with the Division of Investigation during a one week, one to two week targeted review in late June and early July. These were the major findings. These aren't all the findings uh, that I'm trying just to summarize for you. Um, we developed a, also a list of um, immediate action recommendations that could be taken to immediately quickly fix these problems. That information, uh, because of the nature and magnitude of these problems, like you're hearing, um, I felt compelled to immediately meet with Department of Consumer Affairs leadership team and advise them of these problems and other oversight authorities. And that then prompted communications between the Department of Consumer Affairs and the board's executive officer and the involvement of the Division of Investigation in assisting with implementing these recommendations, fixing these problems, and working collaboratively with staff, which is what Stephanie Whitney will talk about once I complete my presentation, which is, for all practical purposes, done, almost done at this point. Mr. So that's Gray. kind of where we are. Um, it's been because of the problems it's been a very accelerated process, um, necessarily, for purposes of protecting consumers. So then, would it be fair to say that this is an overview being given to the board with the understanding that these problems that have been identified are currently being worked on That's and correct. there is That's a correct. solution to this problem um, which, would, which would change what you said as far as because the board took no action? So there is a, so these problems were being given an update, but they are currently being worked on and we don't need board action at this time because they're currently being worked on. And pardon me, as the Vice President, uh, and thank you, Madam President, uh, you are absolutely correct. And because of the nature, <coughs> immediate action was taken. It was our anticipation when the representatives from DCA headquarters uh, met with us that they would be giving an overall review in the context of the findings along with the actions and what had been resolved. So we are somewhat surprised too about the nature of the presentation or the manner in which it is coming to us. We or do not at all deny the facts and the findings. The findings are the findings. However, there was immediate action taken and it was due to the last report with your president and vice president that we were told most, if not all, had been addressed and that DCA and the executive officer for DCA was part of that meeting that had been taken care of. Um, so the information we're receiving is the information. It is fact. However, the manner in which it is being presented leads us to believe that hmm, maybe not necessarily where things done in such a role. We always are here to receive the message. 
we are here to protect the public. And uh, undeniably, see what is being said was historically fact. However, some things have changed. Is there some way to also make sure the public knows the status of what has happened? Thank yeah. you for that, um, Madam Vice President. Um, put in context, I'm not as alarmed as to what I was hearing. Um, what I was hearing led me to believe that this had not been taken care of. So if this is just an overview and this has been taken care of, then I can take a breath now. Just yeah, I, I would like to <laughs> clarify the uh, commentary. Um, the phrasing board did not respond. I actually wanted to, as part of the conversation, uh, when Mr. Frank brought forward these, these findings, we met immediately with, with Ms. Anderson. We found her incredibly inviting, cooperative, participatory, incredibly thoughtful. We worked together on a plan to introduce a division of investigations to assist in the, in the remedy. They went in, we met with staff, and um, Stephanie will provide a presentation that shows that due to the uh, incredible cooperation that Ms. Anderson provided us and participation, these issues are being addressed now. So if the presentation thus far led to a, a, a different movie, I apologize. That was not the intent. It was to mainly set up, here's what we found, and then here's what we're doing. So uh, that's what we'd like to get to if that helps at all. Okay. But I do want to make it clear that the board has been incredibly reactive and participatory in, in, in addressing Mr. Frank's findings. So, and we appreciate that. So, Stephanie. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Good morning, Madam Good morning. President, Madam Vice President, fellow uh, board members. Just kind of an overview of who I am. My name is Stephanie Whitley. I am the supervising investigator with the Division of Investigation in our Enforcement Support Unit. So when you hear about the Division of Investigation, we are traditionally the investigative force for the Department of Consumer Affairs, the law enforcement entity. I, uh, my unit, the Enforcement Support Unit, has um, distinctive roles and responsibilities within the department that are different than our traditional role than just investigating um, matters on behalf of our client boards and bureaus within our department. Part of what I do in my unit is outreach. That is my responsibility to outreach with our clients um, to help with their enforcement needs. So when we talk about um, myself and my unit coming in to assist your board staff, this is a role that we do. Um, I had the pleasure in back in 2015 of coming in during some um, some times with the board to assist with their enforce with your enforcement program back then. Uh, I had two other staff with me to actually support the transition of, of some transitional time. So I've had the great opportunity to work with the majority of the staff of your staff and I've been given that opportunity again. So I just wanted to explain that um, when we throw around the division of investigation that there's kind of separate units and I definitely have a distinctive um, role and responsibility for client outreach and to support. So um, as Ben was saying and Jeff was saying, we, were, um, we accompanied him in some review of cases that were closed in the intake, um, by the intake um, technician. And there was some, I think some, because the lack of management and the staff turnover, I think staff were making interpretations of some procedures. And one of those interpretations was to close um, all anonymous complaints and inmate complaints with a letter saying you need to follow, complete all your reviews at the CDCR level and then once you've exhausted those, you can file a complaint with the department. So we immediately um, stopped that. We brought all of this, let me back up. When we came in and presented to the staff um, on July 17th, we actually met separately with um, Ms. Anderson with each unit and explained what the enforcement monitor had discovered um, during his reviews and we talked about solutions and um, they were very accommodating and wanted to participate in some solutions. So we are there basically to, 
to support them in kind of that, that role that staff had turned over and just wasn't present with them. So with that said, we made the initial, I mean the immediate recommendations that and there will be no c cases closed at that level of intake, that cases will be um, taken and opened and then there'll be some analysis done. For example, on anonymous complaints, and you guys are probably well aware, we could get some really, um, some really valuable I mean, not valuable, but some very critical cases on an anonymous level because there is some real legitimate reasons why people want to remain anonymous, right? And so we have to vet the complaint out. We have to see what information is provided and there could be sufficient enough information in that complaint to allow us to analyze that complaint further, which could actually result in some serious discipline of the individual. So um, I think that's what we started. We um, gave that assignment to the um, actual intake analyst at the analyst level to do that review. And then it was determined that we didn't have enough information to proceed with the um, review or investigation that we would close it at that time. But we would definitely do a thorough review before closing any cases, that there was no case categorically that would be closed without an in-depth review of each. Um, with each fact that we have in the complaint. So with that, um, there was, we reviewed approximately 110 cases that were closed in that manner and determined approximately um, 22 were going to be reopened and per the case, um, the Consumer Protection Enforcement Initiative guidelines that they would be referred over to the Division of Investigation for um, investigation, and then we identified approximately 18 that would go to your special investigators to, um, to do conduct an investigation. So that was, um, we started that, that was our first, with Cheryl, that was our first act that we, we started. Um, the next big item was the um, approximately 100 cases that were pending with the analysts for review for disposition of completed investigations from the Division of Investigation. We went through every case with um, all the analysts in the complaint um, unit and we identified approximate, approximately 45 of those were going to be transmitted to the Attorney General's Office for Discipline. We had approximately 19 were reviewed that were going to need an expert opinion. It was a quality of care, unprofessional conduct type case which definitely needed an expert opinion. So the majority, historically, the majority of those would probably go on for discipline with the Attorney General's office. Our next item. Excuse me, I just oh, wanted. To sorry, Don. Sorry. <laughs> it's very disturbing to me. Um, these were all cases, what you're referring to now are all cases that had been inadvertently closed. No, I'm sorry, I, pro I probably have set the confusion, but the cases that I, the cases that I identified as reopening the, the 22 to go to the division, the uh -huh. 19, that was a separate issue of just closing cases in um, by the intake technician. The next item that I was, I'm moving on to was the actual cases that have been returned back to the board that were completed by the Division of Investigation. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have anything to refer to. So. Okay. <laughs> and that's the, the 45 cases, right? Correct. Okay. Correct, Mr. Derking, correct. Um, so, so that's on, is there any other questions on, on the item that we, all the cases that the completed division of investigation cases have been all reviewed and a disposition has been to de has been determined and they're on their path that's it, going to be closed or going to the AG's office. Those are being processed to go to the Attorney General's office. Is there a, is there a plan of correction to avoid this in the future? You know, you have management in place now. I think you had a lot of staff who were trying to keep up with duties and trying to do duties of, of staff vacancies and the, the overall management of, of the caseload was not occurring. So you do have Brian, um, your chief, and Kelly is in the complaint unit. So 
we are there now to support them in those processes. Yeah, along those same lines, yes, I had a similar uh, question. Um, to what extent do you feel that staffing shortages at the board, and which is caused by various reasons, including the, facing the issue of a possible sunset, plays a role in the delay in responding to all of these files and complaints? Um, is that a factor? in your mind? Yes. Yes, it is. So it's not just staffing ignoring your duties. It's no. a shortage of staffing that yes. plays a role as well, correct? Yes. I would say it wasn't a, it, it, the issue wasn't a staff ignoring their duties. Yeah. Uh, Madam President, if I may, I'm trying to get a conceptual picture of what's happening here. Uh, normally, when we receive a complaint, that is reviewed by the in intake technician. Is that the level of first resort? Yeah, there is. Typically, it would be the office technician. And that position has um, been vacant, so the duties were with the um, MST, who also handles the applicant cases and um, the complaint unit. Okay, because a previous iteration of the enforcement monitor's report would assign to office technicians the ability and or authority to close cases under specific circumstances. That was referred to as the triage or handling of complaints, that is assessing the level of severity, so making a determination. And the concern was, well, is there going to be some objection because of working out of job class? So the specific duties had to be specifically uh, and clearly delineated. So to make a, a determination uh, to close a case, to me that would seem to be a more skilled function, and that's handled by the intake technicians, right? It was being handled by a technician, <coughs> yeah, and not an analyst. Okay, my concern is what cases would be suitable for issuing a notice of warning. We had some examples, again, in a previous iter uh, iteration of the enforcement monitor's report. For example, if there was an infraction or even misdemeanor uh, that occurred very quite remotely, either prior to issue of a license, uh, if uh, an applicant was making uh, uh, trying to get a, uh, a license, or a person had already been licensed, so it'd be rise to the level uh, of an accusation, and it was discovered, either because there was a misrepresentation on an application, or because of uh, information that was brought up. So my question is, do we have an idea or a flow chart regarding uh, triage or appropriate handling of cases that staff is aware of? You know, I'm specifically referring to um, licensee complaints and the handling of licensee complaints. And I think you're discussing um, subsequent arrest notifications and applicant complaints. Is, am I correct, Mr. Derking? Well, that, that's partially correct. Okay. So I can't, I can't talk to um, I didn't focus when I came in to assist, I didn't focus on the applicant handling cases and the subsequent arrest. My focus was actually on the licensee complaints. So that's when I'm talking on these points, that's what specifically I'm talking to is on a technician <coughs> level in taking the licensee complaints that we've made the determination that that position is not appropriate to close licensee complaints at that level that it was needing to go to an analyst for further review. Right, but okay. the, the piece that is not being addressed is the, the anonymous complaint, right? Under what, so do we have a procedure in place to handle all anonymous complaints? Correct. And in your opinion, would that um, result in an increased need for staffing or office resources? I think you had, there is a procedure in place on handling of anonymous complaints and I, I categorize those as a licensee complaint also. 
what you do, but is oh. that generally known to our intake te technicians? That's correct. Yes, it is. And all intake technicians have been trained on how to handle an anonymous complaint? Well, before, before I came in, I don't think so. That's why we had the issues in place um, when Mr. Frank did his review. So when we came in and those were issues that were identified, we, def we immediately changed that procedure okay, and when, trained that individual. Okay, when did we become aware of that? I know there was a meeting you indicated uh, July 17th. It isn't, yes, correct. It was just identified in July of this year? Because Mr. Frank has been enforcement monitor for almost two years now. It was identified, this was not an issue before until recently when Mr. Frank was running recent reports and it was identified and that's when he went to um, Department of Consumer Affairs um, staff and then um, spoke with Ms. Anderson. Yes, if it helps on the timeline on this one, on uh, Mr. Frank did a two-week evaluation that ended June 30th. That's when he found these latest findings on anonymous complaints being summarily just, just closed because they're anonymous. He brought that forward to us. We met with Ms. Anderson. D of I entered uh, on the 17th of the next month and began working on new processes and procedures. Okay, Mr. Clifford, you're with DCA, right? Well, I'm, I'm Jeffrey Mason with DCA. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I'm That's sorry. right. I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. Mason. No, I have to make sure you had, been a long had, had the right culprit. Already. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, we well know uh, we're acquainted with your work. There are a number of healthcare boards and uh, bodies within DCA. Of course. Is there a unanimity with regard to handling anonymous complaints by each of these boards or commissions? For example, does the medical board, how do they handle anonymous complaints? In no board bureau, be it a medical or non medical, uh, has a process that says any anonymous complaint is immediately closed without a review. And that's what was occurring according to Mr. Frank's findings. But we don't have any uh, firm policy that dictates that no, it cannot be closed. Is that right? I mean, is that a fair statement? There's nothing in current law or regulation, no. But best practices is you review every complaint. Okay, best practices, and, and that's yes. my concern. You did indicate that we were incredibly reactive but for me as, as yeah. far as process that's not good enough we need to be proactive mm -hmm. and address issues that come up anticipate any possible issues especially <coughs> with regards to <coughs> one of our core functions which yes. is licensing and discipline I agree John yeah and and the anonymous complaint closure that was that had not been occurring at the board in the past it had been a recent change so um, it was a new policy that had been implemented at the board level. So. How, when yeah. was, did you, dis sorry. did you discover when that, because that was to be my next question was, yeah, Mr. how Frank long had this a, been going yeah. on and when was this new policy right. um, that this, it's, it's very concerning that this has been happening. Right, um, well, I'm, if it helps all, Mr. Frank did his review uh, at the, uh, the last two weeks of June. His findings came forward on June 30th, he came to DCA. And, on, and by 17th of the following month, we were working with your staff on changing that process. No, but did you find, how far do we have to go back? I guess that's the real question. It appears to be this at. calendar year. I, I, yeah, go ahead. So uh, around in March, I noticed in some of the board's internal statistical reporting that there was suddenly a significant increase in the number of cases being closed at intake. And that's what started prompting some awareness. And then that continued for a couple of months, like April, May. And by June, that sort of is one of the statistical measures that prompted the need to, we talked to the enforcement committee, say, we're seeing some different things going on that are a possible cause of concern. That's where we met with the enforcement committee at June 20th and advised the enforcement committee that I had already reached out to DCA to join together with the Division of Investigation and go in and look at some of these processes. And we went in and one of the targets was cases closed at intake. We had no idea what was going on. It appeared it had only been going on significantly for a couple of months. And 
That's when we went in and found that the complaint unit supervisor had separated in March. There had been some turnover of staff. There were people doing new duties. All of that was occurring during that three or four month period. And then we learned that all, we, that all of these cases, there was a rule kind of being applied, a blanket rule to, a, to automatically close at intake all cases submitted anonymously without any investigation. And we then, D of I staff, along with your staff, went through and re-looked at all those cases we did initially, I think, March through May, and identified all the cases that needed to be reopened, not just anonymously submitted, but others. And then we also put on the, the punch list to go back because there was some increase even from like September, <coughs> October to February and go back and just check those again. And that I think has been done, correct? That has also been done. I think there were only a few cases identified during that period. So it appears it really just emerged in a significant way beginning around March. And we have completed 100% re-review of that, those closures, the inmate cases, the anonymous and others closed at intake for other reasons. And where needed, they've been reopened and referred to either the special investigation section or D of I for investigation. And that's where we are today. And we got there in a period of literally, I met with DCA on June 30th, there was a little bit of a process before DCA could meet with the board's executive officer. July 17th, I think, ended up with before that. July 12th. July 12th. And then by July 17th, D of I was in there working with the staff. And staff and D of I have corrected that problem and now need to go through and train the staff, document the procedures. Uh, train the new manager of the complaint unit as to here's how it needs to work to prevent this from occurring on a going forward basis. So that, that was the quick fix. Okay. So that the was problem the isn't a staffing problem. The problem, the, the internal control that was lost was the management. The, the lack of a supervisor in the complaint unit and the lack of a chief of enforcement for an extended period of time that took away, if you will, an internal control over the workload and the workflow and the workforce to prevent these types of things from concurring. I, I thank you for that. And, and it's, thank you for your speedy work and for everybody that was involved. What I'm looking for as a way to move forward now, because quite frankly, Mr. Frank. Um, <laughs> I've heard that one before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we have had, we've been listening to these reports now for a couple, has it been two, almost two years? years. Um, and we have had, like, I recall that one of the major things was like our data is incorrect. And then we had to go through trying to correct the data. So we thought the data was correct. And now we're uncovering that, that things are happening. So moving forward, and I agree with you that lack of management um, has has contributed to these problems, but we also cannot, in my estimation, leave it to simply a manager, because a manager can come and a manager can go. Um, do we, is there a process going to be in, put in place that will have specifics, sort of to what Mr. Deer King was referring to, that this is the guideline, this is what's going to happen, so that if there is not a manager there, there is not a supervisor there, that the staff will know what to do, and if so, and I also would like to see that, because I feel like since I'm being held responsible, <coughs> ultimately the board is responsible for what happens, but I have no idea what is happening or what has been put in place. So that's what I need moving forward because management comes and goes. We need policies, we need procedures, we need, we need things that we can put in place that are tangible, that people can see so that this doesn't happen again because and in this response to that, thank you so much. We are very fortunate to now have an enforcement chief 
and uh, Mr. Vu, I think, is going to give us a little background on what is happening now. We have also now been able to hire a manager for the complaint unit. Um, it, when there is a vacuum in terms of someone in charge, even with written rules, there's no one there to keep someone in check. Mr. Boone. And to address the board members' concerns, I, I understand, I agree wholeheartedly. It's, right now we are being reactive, but the best principle moving forward is to be proactive. With a uh, new leadership in place, we are reassessing and reanalyzing all procedures, documenting everything, learning the process. <coughs> Currently, we do have many internal controls <coughs> to prevent this from not happening again. For example, complaints are all opened at the intake technician level. However, they're closed at an analytical level where it's reviewed thoroughly. So are, there are chains of command at that, at that juncture. Um, but the biggest thing moving forward is to again reassess all procedures to make sure everything is documented. Procedures put in place five, 10 years ago may be outdated. So we want to always ask the question why? Why are we doing things? And that's the current principles we are instilling with the current rank and file staff. And they've been very, um, they've reacted very well. They understand to move forward, to innovate, you have to change, you have to adapt. And they've been taking that in stride. Thank you. I think just to answer, because I understand Ms. Norton's concerns, <coughs> this, this situation seemed kind of like a perfect storm. You actually had a new, um, you had a new intake analyst coming on approximately two weeks before the complaint manager was leaving. Mm -hmm. So the procedures um, that were in place, although they weren't incorrect, they weren't so specific that you could follow them down like kind of a laundry list. And so it was, it was a perfect storm and that management was moving out and staff were, were coming in about the same time. So they had no foundational training. And if they had a foundational training, you're right, they should be able to perform without, and basically keep the lights on and keep things functioning. It just happened to be a perfect storm and that just that situation kind of fell and people were making interpretations at the best of their abilities. So. Thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna proceed with my, with my checklist. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. <coughs> so as I was, um, so on, on, so on our intake closures, we have definitely resolved that. And um, as Mr. Vu was saying, we are working very closely with him and we um, have been rewriting the procedures to specifically clarify on step-by-step -step handling of all um, complaint types. So then I was covering the cases that were coming back in on completed investigations. That was one of Mr. Frank's findings. Those had been um, with the intake analysts for some time, and so we triage all of those and determine the dispo, and those have moved on to um, where the determination was made. The special, um, we had, the special investigative group did some triaging of cases that they determined to close with a notice of warning. Specifically during um, early 2017, some cases with the special investigators were closed categorically. Uh, we call them sleepy nurses. Some of your, your LVNs who have, are in a home health care setting who have the facilities have complained that they've fallen asleep while on duty. Those were closed categorically. We had some cases closed categorically of time card issues, either so-and-so said they were here at eight o'clock, but they really didn't get in at 8.30. Um, those we reviewed because there is some, depending on the, the case type on cases of nurses falling asleep, we need to evaluate what that complaint actually is. What was the status of the patient? Could that, could some patient harm have occurred? So instead of closing those, like we are talking about almost in the intake, those need to be evaluated on a case by case um, scenario. So we reviewed approximately 49 of those in 17, we determined that needed to have a little further evaluation conducted to make sure we have thoroughly reviewed. So letters went out 
to the licensees who cases um, that we had closed and are reopening. The letter was approved by legal and sent out, and we have received some phone calls back from those licensees. Obviously, they have some concern if the case is being reopened, but um, there is, we are telling them that um, basically there just needed to be, they were closed kind of prematurely and we needed to do a further review, but it doesn't mean that there's going to be any discipline, but just a review needed to be done. I have a full of questions. So, so where does the line, um, where does the line meet where there is the board's responsibility, and I think now I'm, I'm thinking specifically to the time card fraud that, mm -hmm. that you mentioned, where someone said they showed up at 8 and they showed up at 8.30. Where is, is, is there a line between that and being an employer issue as opposed to a board issue? Because we could get really tied up in, um, it, yes, yes, because that really is up to the employer. So that's exactly correct. So those cases we do close. That is a, okay, good, that I'm like freaking out now thinking that we are going like, to, no. <laughs> so, but there are cases that we get in that same vein that we have people committing fraud. We have people saying they're working at this home and we have some people in there working at another home at the same time. So there is like a magnitude on the spectrum of the seriousness of those cases that it can actually go into a criminal a criminal aspect if they're um, you know not working at all that shift and they're documenting in medical records they're doing assessments so it is definitely a, it's a one one by one case review of those types of cases not just a categorically we're just going to close it Ms. Whitley if also if I may interject um, while it is an employer issue I believe in our uh, BNP codes and Mr. Vu if I'm correct there is also a uh, uh, statute for unprofessional conduct and uh, not just gross negligence and incompetence but also unprofessional conduct which is if you're lying on your time card that could in some cases may be considered unprofessional conduct so that's I believe that's what Ms. Whitley's saying is there's a spectrum of you when you say time card falsification there's a whole spectrum yes. of that sometimes it is an employer issue and oversight sometimes it is unprofessional conduct so that's I believe what enforcement determines no, I, I totally agree with that I'm just I'm not saying that we shouldn't invest, but there, there does seem to be a line because if we're going, I guess my ultimate question is going to go back to, are we staffed sufficiently to in a timely manner investigate the things that we need to investigate? And are you, in your review of what has been going on, are you able to identify that in order to function efficiently and to protect the public, which is what our task is, we have enough staff or we need more staff? I guess that's what I'm looking for Ultimately. because I'm not opposed to investigating whatever needs <coughs> to be investigated, but I am opposing to like increasing the list of things that need to be investigated if we don't have staff to do it with because we will just end up right back where we are. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think just to note, Ms. Norton, when we reviewed um, 49 of those cases, we determined only 17 out of that 49 probably should have had some extra review. So I think, you know, the majority we did not determine to say all, you know, 49 needed to be open. It was a very, it was a small number that we identified. So into your response, yes, no, there, we're not going to open up the, the spectrum of all cases in that category because there is not enough staff, and nor do I think that it's an efficient amount of time, even if you had that amount of staff. Thank you. So. So the other um, support we're providing is with the special investigators with your board. Um, currently, I think May is when the supervising special investigator um, left, and so They've been without a direct supervisor also, so um, specifically I am reviewing reports and making recommendations with Brian is also obviously participating to get the special investigators cases closed and reviewed um, in addition to subpoenas that need to be served. So we are getting down the road with the special investigators. 
the citation program, the position um, has, it was in the complaint unit. The citation analyst position has been moved up to the discipline unit. Um, Cheryl, we all collaborated and that was the best place for that position. It was determined and I know they're in the process of hiring for that position, so that should be done very it's soon. Done. It's done. Yay. So, um, so that was one of the items Mr. Frank identified, so that program shall be up and running soon. Jay Prouty, your discipline manager, was working with the complaint unit, um, and one of his leads in his unit to learn that process of the complaint, I mean, of the citation, so when the, com the new analyst does come on, they're ready to train them and get them up to speed. So that was some great um, progress in that area. We talk about the, the CPLX cases um, in Bury specifically, and those were cases that are, were closed, um, subsequent arrest cases that were closed pending adjudication, because really it's out of the, the board's control when the adjudication process is occurring. So Mr. Frank identified doing a count of the current cases closed with that, specifically the analysts who are handling those cases, there were some discrepancies on the actual number. And um, so we identified all of those cases and have um, basically identified that some cases were just happened to be uh, assigned to a different analyst or um, they weren't counted properly physically. And so we have validated all the numbers and we are good to go on that. So um, that was a um, good check the box um, project for us. So, And also, Mr. Vu, um, myself, we met with Sean O'Connor um, on, on, on Breeze and basically the question is, is because this is this CPLX closing of cases is a department, it's a department issue and um, discussing kind of best practices on how we should proceed with handling those type of cases. So uh, Mr. Vu um, is actively working with IT staff to, we're gonna come up with a solution to be able to properly manage those case loads. What does CPLX stand for? It means close pending um, criminal action. So I think on, you know, on my uh, checklist that um, Ben had identified, we have definitely have accomplished or we are um, the reviewing of special investigators and supporting them is kind of just an, an active um, process. But, you know, the staff have, these are staff that I have a relationship I have worked with before. I've been with them for, you know, having, um, going for you know, two years ago and so the staff have been tremendous and they have worked extremely hard to accomplish our lists and I, I'm very very proud of them and, and I'm honored to to work with them and, and I'm thankful for my role to be able to collaborate with them because really it is it is a team we are a team at this department and um, really this is a great um, the collaboration that's occurring with your board staff and specifically the department and the division is, is one that I'm pretty proud of. So I think with that, Sam, can I questions? I actually just, <coughs> not a question, but a comment. Um, Ms. Willie, I wanted to thank you uh, for the work that, that you're doing. Um, and for those new board members, um, we have several new board members. I just, uh, we give you some history that Miss Whitley and her team came in a few years ago, a couple few years ago, and helped us and performed exceptionally well. Um, uh, professional, um, like I said, it was a, a exceptional uh, performance of uh, your help that you came in, and I have full confidence in you and your team um, to to handle this situation with uh, in cooperation with us. Um, I agree with you that um, uh, you, the, the management uh, during the management transition, you know things. You know, obviously the facts are the facts and things got misinterpreted. Um, but I'd like to also reassure this board that, um, that the, uh, the board and with uh, Ms. Whitley's help and with our new enforcement chief, who 
by all accounts has hit the ground running. <laughs> and our complaints manager, Kelly, and our uh, discipline ma new manager, Jay Prouty, who has a, a wide depth and breadth of experience um, with the board, that the, uh, we're prepared to handle this. And that uh, uh, because of Ms. Uh, Whitley's actions and her team, uh, it's already been handled. Uh, most of it and ongoing uh, with Mr. Vu and uh, with the managers. I think I speak for uh, Mr. Maxi and myself as the new enforcement committee that we're also um, uh, prepared to give our full efforts um, in the way, any way that the enforcement committee can, um, can um, c collaborate uh, with the uh, other teams. So uh, I'd like to reassure the board um, that this uh, by all your accounts, this has been handled, and I have full confidence that can be handled and prepared to handle it. Thank you. Any, any other comments from the board? Denise? So will your, I take it your comments will be read or put together in conjunction with Mr. Frank's comments. It'll show that he had made some findings, and it'll also show that your team came in and helped us to make appropriate changes. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Jeff Mason and DCA and Stephanie Whitley to working and Ben Franks in working with Brian Vu and getting things corrected very quickly. Um, She's very excited. So, yeah. I think I think that we have a good chief yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, Brian, do you have anything to add? A lot of the board's concerns will be addressed later um, during 24B, during the EO's report. But I also wanted to kind of reinforce my commitment with the board's mission moving forward. The biggest thing is retention, recruitment of staff. We want to make sure that all staff are fulfilled, but at the same time challenged. We want to ensure that all processes, we want to analyze every process in the past and make sure it's the most effective yet efficient moving forward. Um, with colleagues, DOI, the enforcement monitor, DCA, the AG's office. The biggest thing is to never work in isolation. We have so many resources available to us, and it's, it's tapping into those resources. Um, reaching out with DOI investigation staff, reaching out to the RN board to see what their processes are, what can we learn from them, keeping an open mind. And that's the biggest management pillar that I bring um, to this board. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from board members? Thank you. We'll move on to the evaluation committee um, report. Thank you, Madam Chair. The evaluations committee has met several times, and uh, we're very pleased to see uh, the staff who's worked with us present, and uh, we'd like to invite them to join in making the report that would be item 18 for anyone who's looking for documents um, there were a number of things that the evaluations committee has reviewed uh, we did address the concern about the pocket cards and we believed it would be extremely helpful to everyone not only the board but the general public to have a sense of what is the flow once you submit an application for licensing. Why does it take what feels like a thousand and one days versus what really happens? And so there was, uh, we've actually, thank you to the staff, built a flow chart that talks about vocational nurse examination application and there is a similar chart that also stages the steps for 
PT examination application and its flow. Uh, staff who work with us, if you would be kind of to approach and just introduce yourselves. Good morning. Um, my name is Jen Johnson. I'm the Evaluations Program Manager. And with me is Samantha Colma. She is our Budget Analyst. And next to me is Rochelle Johnson. She's our Support Service Manager. Um, we are part of the Evaluations Committee. And I um, wrote agenda item number 18. I wrote the report for um, the committee. Would you like me to um, report this, sure. Vice President? Okay. So a little background, um, the evaluation committee is um, charged with advising the board on matters <coughs> related to the approval of candidates seeking qualification for examinations to obtain California licensure as VN and PTs via non-traditional pathways um, based on a few items. Um, one of them is completion of education and work experience that is equivalent to the minimum requirements uh, for an approved school of bulk nursing in the state. Um, secondly, current valid licensure um, as a bulk pr pr practical nurse in another state and completion of equivalent military education and training no less than um, 12 months of practice and honorable discharge from any branch of the U.S. military. Additionally, the committee considers and advises the board on matters related to requirements for continuing education and competency. The evaluation committee has met twice, June 16th and July 26th. The next meeting is scheduled for September 14th this year. Um, items discussed in our first um, meeting on June 16th were roles of the evaluation committee um, and we had um, edited the, the role. Um, we did staffing updates, and we also reviewed the evaluation procedure, um, procedures, performance measure, and statistics. Um, also, number four, exam application updates. We um, sent an application to legal for revision um, for approval to add the military option. Um, also, cross-training, the phone systems, um, the report was done in July 26th um, in that meeting. And then we also discussed drafting of the letter of the, for the um, CE audit project. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss in our licensing and um, evaluations report um, background on that and an update. On um, July 26th, items that were discussed were um, the phone systems report. Our, my IT staff um, submitted a report to the committee. Um, we also, again, talked about a continuous agenda item, which is staffing update. Um, approval letter, um, the CE audit letter was um, drafted and um, approved by the evaluation committee. We also, um, Samantha and another um, one of my evaluators, Siki Chen, worked um, together on the examination um, application process diagram. Um, we also um, discussed um, PC surplus donation. We had some um, older PCs that were um, basically wiped clean and new ones were given to the board and we are donating those to um, schools. Oh, good. So um, we are now actually the in the report, we were working with San Juan Unified School District. However, um, they did not respond, so um, we're working with another school district um, right now. Um, action items that were completed, we um, reiterated the expectations to um, reception staff on incoming calls, um, set goals, and set up trainings. We also, the, um, per value, the evaluation performance measure and statistics um, were talked about and we wanted to not only have our um, matrix on it, but incorporate color code for the green, red, and yellow so um, it's easy to identify what needs attention. Um, number three, um, what I talked about, the CE audit letter from the board. 
um, that has been posted to the website. Um, there are a couple um, revisions that we are going to add um, once it went to the Office of Communications at DCA. Um, we are working collabor collaboratively, um, actually as of this week. Um, I'm still getting emails from them, so I will edit that when I return to the board on Monday, just to add a little verbiage. Um, but that, as that also has been added to our phone tree regarding the CE um, audit being um, ceased. And on the website. Yes, I, I did say that on our website. Currently, it's on our, um, the letter is on our website right now. Um, also, the um, diagram that we talked about, the examination application process um, diagram was approved and posted on our website uh, for applicants to review, whether it's the um, site tech apps or the VNs. Can I add something to that? Yes. And also in yesterday's director's forum, we also um, introduced those diagrams oh. to all the program directors so they can um, show those to the students. And That's great. We let them know where to access it on our website. Thank you. And that's our evaluations uh, committee report. Any questions? Madam President, I just have a comment. Okay, Samantha. Um, just to the uh, talented and dedicated ladies in front of us and also Mr. C.K. Chen, um, I would just like to thank the uh, staff for their work on this committee truly uh, work at the speed of light <laughs> to get not just this uh, flow sheet, but other diagrams and reports and matrices and all this other stuff that we had requested um, was done astonishingly fast and accurately. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Do any other board members have comments? Thank you. Thank you. And this is an example of how staff in support of board and particularly the committees, how smoothly things can run. We really can't do it without the support of staff. Thank you. And then also thank you to Samantha, who will be leaving the evaluation committee for another committee. And welcome to Arlita, who will be joining us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look forward to this. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay. Agenda item 19, licensing committee report recommendations and possible actions. Myself and Paul Sellers, I want to thank John Vertito. He was the, I know that's why I saw him. He was actually on the licensing committee prior to his departure from the board. Um, and the licensing committee is also staffed by Jen Johnson, Rochelle, Rich, uh, Rochelle Johnson, and Siki Chen. Um, I want to thank them for their work on this and keeping us in on our path. Um, since John, John was present on June 2nd's meeting with um, the staff, so if I could have Jen Johnson come up and give a little background on that, I would appreciate that. Hello again. So I will um, discuss the licensing committee report. Um, again, the board members present um, on this, um, as our president stated, the initial uh, meeting, um, John Fertito was on that. Um, and then also another member is Paul Sellers. Um, staff present is myself, Rochelle Johnson, and Siki Chen. A little background on the licensing committee. Um, we develop strategies to proactively involve, um, improve consumer service to mitigate complaints and wait times. Um, this committee will review the current complaints and devise a mitigation strategy to engage the full board. The licensing committee has met twice, June 2nd and July 12th. Former board member um, John Vertito was in attendance um, he's no longer a board member, therefore was replaced by the board president, Ms. Tammy Endozo, and board member Paul Sellers. Uh, they attended July 12th committee meeting via um, conference call. 
Items discussed on June 2nd, discussion and consideration of committee scope. Number two, staffing updates. Number three, review of licensing division performance measures and statistics. And what I mean by that is we always provide um, performance measures to the board. However, um, Mr. Vertito wanted to add the color code matrix, and actually that was completed by my evaluator, Siki Chin. So um, as you won't see it at this board meeting, um, because he had to gather the data starting from June. So at the next um, board meeting in November, um, those will be present. Also, um, items discussed, number four, dis discussion and consideration of outstanding accounts receivable and potential board um, presentation. Basically, how much ARs are we, um, owed and collected. Um, and then also discussion on franchise tax board collecting um, accounts receivable. Number five, discussion and review of common complaints received from schools and also from applicants' licensees. So we'll be gathering that um, for our next committee meeting. Items discussed on July 12th, commonly frequently asked questions to update the website. Um, that was Rochelle Johnson was able to work with her staff to answer our phones. And they came up with some com FAQs, basically. And we will discuss um, the FAQs that she um, brought to the table and discuss those at our next committee meeting. Um, items discussed on July 12th is, I'm sorry, I just said that. Um, review of licensing division um, measures and statistics, the color code matrix. We just <coughs> basically let the new um, committee members um, know what was discussed at the previous one. And then we also do continuously staffing update. Um, tasks to be accomplished, gathering data on the common complaints received and addressed with appropriate staff, um, identify if training um, will be needed. Review the common FAQs and update the website. And review the outstanding accounts receivable and discuss possible presentation to the board. That's the committee report. Any questions? Madam President, I have a, just a general question. Oh, um, most of the complaints that are received, would they be from employers or from the public consumers? Yeah, we, we were discussing the ones that, um, from the applicants or licensees that are calling in. Oh, okay. Um, from employers, they would go through enforcement. Oh, okay, very good, thank you. Belna? Um, thank you for your report. Um, can you help me understand why your committee would be dealing with accounts receivable from the franchise tax board? Uh, yes. Make that connection. No problem. So um, basically the licensing um, division um, has the cashiering under them. So that's how, why we would be dealing with that. And to answer your question regarding the franchise tax board, they assist um, boards and bureaus with collecting accounts receivable. And so it's an option that we were just putting on the table to discuss. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from board members? Thank you, this again is, we couldn't do a lot of this without the staff assistance. Thank you. They do a tremendous job for us. Thank so, you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. <coughs> At this time, I think we'll take a quick 10 minute break so board members can oh. check out and um, before we get started. So we'll return at 11.15. So we're gonna take a quick break and return at 11.15. So we're gonna we're in agenda item 20, legislation committee report, and uh, recommendations po possible action. Um, Ms. Cheryl. Yes. Thank you. Yes, on August 11, 2017, the legislative and regulations committee met, consisting of myself and Mr. Durkin, public member. Cheryl, can we have you speak into the microphone yes, so they course. can hear us in the back? 
All right, do I need to repeat? All right, so I'll assume you heard me the first part. All right, so one of the issues that we dealt with on our agenda was that we believe that we felt an amendment to the role of the Legislative and Regulations Committee was necessary. Um, back in, on February 10th, 2017, um, we presented, or the committee has presented a board measure to remove certain authority of the board to act on legislation regulations between scheduled meetings. That was approved by the board. However, due to changing regulations, especially with regard to sunset and other issues, and the promulgation of many new regulations in the area <coughs> that affects the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians, we felt that a more proactive approach uh, uh, and speed and efficiency was necessary in order for us to you know, at, react to some of these uh, changing legislations. So we had proposed that we go back now and give the committee authority to act and by that, we're asking now to, to add the following uh, regulation. Um, quote, after the completion of relevant research and analysis, the committee is authorized to recommend to the board a position of support, oppose, or watch. The committee is also authorized by the board to act on legislation and regulations between scheduled board meetings. Such actions must be reported to and ratified by the full board at the next scheduled board meeting. So at the committee that was moved seconded and that passed. Um, I think what I'll do is just go through all of the different motions and then I'll ask for approval of the report at the end. Is that a good idea? Okay. All right, so then the, uh, we had discussed various issues um, that were of concern we thought that not only do we need to address proposed bills that affect specifically the industry, but the healthcare industry as a whole. We felt that we needed to stay abreast of those because some of those could impact the um, profession, even though it didn't specifically identify the profession. All right, so uh, the issue of AB1, Two two nine came up. Um, that relates to the sunset bill. Um, that is an amendment to it. And uh, without going into that into too much detail, because I believe my co-committee person would like to have uh, provide comments on that, we did suggest within our committee that our board members reach out to uh, legislature uh, members to see if um, we can sort of informally lobby or convince them that the board needed to stay in operation, All right? Yes. So we're working, that's, um, we want to do it in writing, but uh, whether the writing comes out or not, we want to actively, we want to encourage our board members to actively reach out. So we talked about changes in the staffing of the Legislative and Regulations Committee. Uh, right now we have a Ms. Kalma who is helping us with that to research some of the proposed bills. However, that is not normally her job responsibilities, but she's been filling in ad, ad, she's been ad, she's been filling in very well. <laughs> continue to uh, reach out and to ultimately hire someone who can fulfill that position for them. All right, so let me go on to the next important issues that we <coughs> brought up, and that is to amend a regulation, Vocational Nurses Section 2530 and Tech Regulations 2585, which should be of interest to the schools. Right now, we have a regulation which allows for 10% below average, 10% annual pass rate below the average, whereas you can still remain in business and still continue to bring in students and have an open school. What we're finding is that with time, 
as the annual pass rates continue to drop, if we continue to use a standard of 10% below the average, as the past, you know, the, the rate that's acceptable, then ultimately we'll find ourselves going lower and lower and lower down. Okay, and we'll be so far below the national average that it simply will not be acceptable. So the proposal is that instead of using a 10% criteria that we um, have a fixed pass rate, such as 75%. So we pass that motion, however, we're passing it off to the Education Committee to give us feedback as to what would be the appropriate pass rate, whether it's 75% or 70% or whichever is appropriate. So, um, but ultimately, ultimately we are moving to change that regulation. <coughs> So noted as the Education Committee. Thank you. <laughs> May I ask a question about, about what you Yes. Saying? If I understand you correctly, um, we have sort of a moving target right now. Um, and, and I know for a fact from going to uh, national boards that uh, other states do not have a moving target. And um, in my, if I'm, not, I'm envisioning this correctly, you can correct me if I'm wrong. With this moving target, <coughs> If schools just underperform, underperform the majority of them, they just reduce their own standard, basically. The standard just gets lowered, lowered. Yes. So we could eventually, and we're already, our, um, our state is already, has a lower pass rate than other, other states. We have a low pass rate compared to other states. And that's, uh, I don't think, reflective of our excellence. And um, we have the most number of vocational nurses of any state and of several states combined. Um, so I think we do, uh, if I'm envisioning correctly, I think you are correct that that would be an appropriate thing to have as a, a fixed target instead of a moving target. Um, <coughs> so um, those were the main items of the subject of discussion. Uh, we had also had some future items we'd like to discuss. Um, but also, um, we've attached the regulations and uh, proposed bills from the Assembly and the proposed bills from the Senate, which we have stated that we would like to either watch, oppose, support, or amend. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of those proposed bills? Okay. Cheryl? Yes. I, I don't have a question about the proposed bill. I think I have a, a process question. Mm -hmm. um, understanding that we need to have a committee that's looking at legislative and regulations because those things change. My concern is that this new language that is recommended to be adopted that gives this committee the ability to react to a legislative change yes. is, with all due respect, comprised of two public members and not there's not a licensee on there so in the case of what's recently been happening with the respiratory therapy board there's some legislative action that could be taken that i would think that you would need input from a licensee so that's my concern with the language as it is currently um, written because what you the committee can act and then i believe it says that the report is given to and ratified by the full board at the next meeting. Yes. So you could act on your own without, not that you would, but that's the way the language is written. Well, it allows the committee to take action. For instance, there was a committee, legislative committee meeting that occurred on April or August the 21st. It was between our last board meeting and the board meeting today. And that is an example of a type of um, committee where we or one of us could have gone, appeared, <coughs> spoke in support of the board mm -hmm. for us, and we would not have had time to come back to the board because there wouldn't have been an opportunity. So that's an example. Um, as far as input, I think that there's always been 
an understanding and exchange between the board members at board meetings about what their positions are on the issues. Um, and I believe that even though there are public members appointed, I think that the public members still look out for the best interest of the profession, um, also balancing the need for the protection of the public. And so I don't know if that's a question that addresses how the board has set up its committee or its appointment or not. <coughs> Um, but I don't believe that we should fail to take action because there's not necessarily a professional member on that committee. We have to take action. Ms. Turner, is it correct, I believe, Mr. Mac, um, Mr. Swenson, um, if I'm incorrect, um, the committee, the legislative committee could still at all times um, communicate and collaborate with um, Ms. Anderson, who is our, she uh, has a wide breadth of knowledge about PT and V and scope of practice um, as, as some sort of a professional input in between meetings, no? Yes, as a matter of fact, she, she is on our, Ms. Anderson is on our committee. Um, she meets with us. And so, yes, of course, we would communicate with her. Um, Mr. Deerkin, did you have any yes, input uh, on that? Yeah, just as a general proposition, we would <coughs> always, almost always, and I can't think of any exceptions uh, off the top of my head, but that's not to say there can't be an exception. We would always ask, uh, act uh, on behalf of the board when the board has made uh, its position known. And let me give the example of, I went to the Appropriations Committee on this past Monday in Sacramento, the 21st, and Ms. Anderson and I uh, sat through, well, I think it was a couple hundred bills. That was uh, quite a day. And so when the time for public comment came, uh, I spoke in support. And that was the appropriate vehicle for that, because this is our sunset mm -hmm. bill. And unless we have a bill moving forward, and in order for this board to continue to exist, we do need legislative action. Mm -hmm. So we indicated that we would support if the, there is a, a uh, provision for an extension of the sunset, sunset date. We recommended two to four years <coughs> for its commensurate with other boards and commissions under the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, we wanted to respond to a previous legislative concern, as specifically with Senator Hill's concern, and it was based on the uh, the, the court case, Dental Examiners versus North Carolina. And in that case, there was a policy consideration because the dental examiners in the state of North Carolina were all licensees. So there was a concern about regulating the industry by licensees. So we did make a point that this is one of the few boards or commissions in the state mm -hmm. that has a public member majority with respect to uh, licensees. Um, we did reiterate that every board member takes very seriously the responsibility of exercising the board's functions in licensing, education, and enforcement. We've taken great strides to not only respond to the monitor's report, but also institute systematic, uh, systemic uh, improvements in our procedures to uh, Ms. Norton's previous point. And we're also um, uh, in the process of, of hiring a new EO. Most of our members are now recent appointees, so any concerns that have been uh, remaining from the past, you know, we now have really a fresh start, a new outlook. So that's what I communicated to the Appropriations Committee. So that's just an example of the action that we could and should be taking uh, in between perhaps board meetings, but we would always do so uh, at the direction of the, the board in response to a known position by the board, especially on an important bill like AB 1229. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I, so let me be clear, I'm not concerned about any action that you would take related to a 
1229. I'm concerned about an action that you may take that specifically relates to a practice concern uh, <coughs> without input from a practicing <coughs> licensee. That, that, is, that is my concern. Um, and I don't believe it is my own concern. I believe this topic has been brought up at previous board meetings. Um, and I believe that um, one of our previous board members had a similar concern. Um, it, it's just that that specific piece of it that I'm concerned about that gives the legislative committee the ability to act on behalf of the whole board. Um, so yeah, again, I, I think it's only in response to an action that the board has already ratified. So we would just continue uh, the message of the board forth to the appropriate uh, legislators? Yeah, it's my feeling that we won't necessarily independently come up with our own no. personal that's positions. It's a position that's been discussed and um, by the entire board. It's just we ha may have to take action on what was discussed by the board between board meetings. Samantha? Um, I wanted to chime in here because actually at the last board meeting, I actually did um, express some concern about, about having a provision in, like this in here. Um, but what, with, through some research that I've done and uh, with experience of uh, this current legislative session, my, the reality is um, things can move fast at times. Sometimes they move excruciatingly slow, like frozen molasses and sometimes they move extremely quickly. Um, and three months in between a board meeting is not enough time uh, for our legislative committee to take a position on something that could have uh, crucial, critical effects on this board, even this board's operations. Um, so once I, I came to realize the, uh, the logistics of the legislation and uh, how things work, um, I would fully support this, and I did express concerns last time, but I, uh, I see the reality and the need to uh, give our legislative committee the uh, tools um, to know, act if, if I may, critically. To, to Ms. James Perez's point, the current status of AB 1229, uh, we're in suspense, which means it could be recalled at any point by the author or by the committee. And so we will hear uh, more about this bill. The only thing that's happening right now is since it's in suspense, it's not going to the full uh, body for a vote. So that would necessarily require us to be uh, reactive on very short notice. Oh, no. Any other questions? Any other questions or comments? No. I make a motion. Public comment. We don't have a motion. Yet. Okay. All right. So um, remember, I'm going to remove move on the whole report. So I just have a couple of other things. Our um, discussion of possible future items. We want to continue with our legislative tracking. Um, we have to report back on the update of amending the location and nurses and site tech regulations related to the pass rate and um, yeah, continue our discussions with all proposed regulations um, that pass through. Oh yes, an important one. Uh, the other issue is that um, when there are issues that affect legislation um, or legislation that affects issues within the board and they go through other committees they should also come to the Legislative and Regulations Committee. And if the Re Legislation and Regulations Committee has an issue that affects certain committees like education or licensing, it should be referred to that committee as well. Um, so that was the other thing. All right. So that is the substance of the report. Um, I move that the report be accepted. Second. Okay. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so Cheryl made the motion. Do I need to second? No. Okay. So is there any comments or questions from the board members? 
So <clears throat> just a follow-up question on um, how I want to fully understand, and I'm sure there'll be some public comment related to the changing of the um, pass rates. So we are going to move from our current status, which is to take the state average and a school that falls 10 percentage points below and move into a system that is a standard pass fail rate. We're moving from a standard that um, is set well, by the current pass rate less 10 percent. Mm -hmm. is, is that a good way of saying it? Well, it's a state um, average um, and within 10 percent. Yes, within the 10 percent range to a fixed pass rate. And Ms. Anderson, <coughs> would you like to say something on that for well, us? Well, I understand it. I'm just, I'm just reiterating. I, I understand. Um, well, but there, there's a part that's, that you're missing. The actual motion says the committee requests the Education Committee consider and provide input regarding possible amendment. Yeah. So, so ultimately, yeah. the education committee. So it's it's a motion, but it's still being referred to the education committee for input as to what an appropriate number, number, number fixed standard sure. pass rate would be for us. And at the end of that, then we would need a motion to seek legislation. Well, no, no. 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 we would at the end of that, we would yeah seek a motion to change the regulations. The board's regulations. So we would not need legislative. No. no, 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 no. So the board changes the regulations, and the legislature changes the statutes. Okay. So Cheryl, yes. if I'm understanding you. Yes. It refers to the Education Committee. They concur. In order to change statute, does it not need? It's regulation. It's a regulation. Oh, it's a regulation. Yes. Yes, it's regulations. But the board. So again, uh, okay. Yeah. So it does not require legislation. No. No. Um, the, the, excuse me, just as a, pardon me, just as a point of clarification, if I'm understanding as chair of the education committee, the committee is being asked to gather information. The committee itself is not going to say up or down, but we must gather information, and that would include hearing stakeholders before we come back to the board with information or with a recommendation. Did I hear that correctly? Well, we don't want to tell the Education Committee how to perform its function, but probably, absolutely, sort of, <laughs> kind of, it but would yes. require <laughs> yeah. stakeholder feedback. Of course. Of course. Schools, absolutely. students, the absolutely. public. So understanding that. So noted. Thank you. It would come back to the full board mm -hmm. before doing anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. Education oh. would come back to but the education will come education. back to a report and then the legislation regulation committee would incorporate that proposal into its change in the regulations which would come back to the board for final vote since the rule is embodied in existing regulations it would be a process of amending the regulations the procedure for doing that would involve a board vote to authorize pursuing the amendment. Then there's a separate process that has to be followed through the Office of Administrative Law to obtain approval of the amendment. One other comment I can make, also going back to the idea of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Law, um, if the if this body uh, delegates the authority um, to uh, communicate with the legislature on uh, pending bills and then seek ratification uh, later. That sort of delegation would um, create a situation where the committee itself will be required to comply with the uh, notice and agenda requirements of the open meeting law. Could you further clarify that last 
Okay, so you're saying that, <coughs> okay, bag leaking, we understand what that is. Notice requirement to the public, we understand what that is. So you're saying that in the case where the committee is going to act before it acts or when it meets, it needs to comply with the bag leaking act? If a committee is advisory and it's comprised of two members, less than three members of the body, then it doesn't require strict compliance with the Bagley Clean Open Meeting Law. But if the board itself delegates authority to a committee to act on its behalf, then there has to be compliance with the notice and agenda requirements. So it's the difference between a, a committee being advisory or the committee having delegated authority. So part of this pending motion involves the delegation of authority. So that would be a, a change in um, the requirements under the open meeting law. So are you saying that that applies to, uh, assuming that the board votes, this, will that apply to every committee meeting that this committee has or just in the case where it's making a decision about taking action? The code section itself, which is 11121 subdivision A, does not differentiate in that situation. So where it does not differentiate, then the committee would be required in all instances when it possesses delegated authority to uh, comply with the Bagley-Keen notice and agenda requirements. So would that, if I'm understanding correctly, because the board is delegating to a committee the ability to act on its own then it must notice any action that it will take. On the other, the flip side of that is because right now our committees are not delegated to act on their own, it comes back to the full board, and the full board is an open meeting that has been noticed, it meets that requirement. It's just in the act of delegating to a committee the ability to act. So any committee that we would delegate the ability to act independently would have to adhere to Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. That's correct, and what that would in practice mean is there'd have to be notice and an agenda posted 10 days in advance of the meeting of the committee. Um, Mr. Swenson, uh, we were talking about some uh, critic, uh, time concerns and criticality of things when they do move fast, moving fast. Uh, what if something uh, had to do with legend reg came up and uh, like Mr. Deerking was saying, the hearing on it was going to be in less than 10 days. Could, we, could the Ledge and Reg Committee have an emergency meeting? The exception to the notice requirement for emergency meetings is uh, extremely limited and it wouldn't apply in that situation. So can you advise us because we may have a time when legislation comes forward that may uh, affect this board critically even its existence um, and we would need to act upon it. What would be your uh, advice to us? How could we act upon that in uh, honoring Bagley Keene and allowing our uh, committee to perform its function? How can we do that? In those sorts of uh, situations, it would be possible for the executive officer to have one directional communication with each board member about the matter. Um, but the board members themselves could not communicate uh, be uh, between themselves about the matter. So our EO could communicate uh, one way with board members individually, board members cannot communicate against them amongst them against amongst themselves um, to take a position. Is what you're saying on some on something emergency legislation? That's correct. That okay. would be the spoke and wheel situation that I discussed earlier in my comments on um, the 
the bag with Kena. So basically, we'd go, our conduit of communication would only be with Ms. Anderson. With the executive officer. Okay. Uh, can, can you, I'm sorry to drag this out, but <coughs> I, I, I think your question is, is, is important. So if an item came up and there was less than 10 days to act, if we've authorized the, the legislative committee to, to act independently, they could act in less than 10 days if required? No. Yes or no? No. No. Then, there would have to be 10 days notice of the meeting and the post an agenda. So that would be the only exception would be something under 10 days. They had 11 days, theoretically, they could then act independently if we authorize that. And they noticed it that first day. If I'm understanding correctly, it's any meeting that the legislative committee has, if we give them the authority to act independently. Yeah, I understand that. And, uh, yeah. Any meeting they would have to notice. That, that I understand. I'm just, uh, I think that question about that 10-day window is, is actually important. I think it's probably a, an exception that that would happen, but I just want to be clear on what, what whether they could or could not act under those very unique circumstances. So I guess there's very few things that don't strike me down for saying this. <laughs> There's very few things <coughs> in the legislature that happen fast. Even 1229 didn't happen fast. Um, we have to re you know, we have to be react. So I, I understand the intent. The intent is to give the legislative committee committee the ability to act on our behalf when something comes up in between board meetings. Um, It bumps up against the Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act because of the ability to act. And if you think about it in not just legislative, any committee, because it's not because the public has not been informed and the public has not had an opportunity to weigh in. That's that's the rub that we're running into right now. We want to give the ability to the legislative committee to act on our behalf, but we can't give it if it's left without a notice. Okay, wasn't this language or similar language in there before? Not and the it was taken out and now we wanna put it back? I don't think the ability for the committee to act on behalf of the board was in there. Well, the way I- uh, okay. Excuse me, that, that very same language was there. It was when the compliance. committee met in January. Um, the report when it was reported to the board in February is when the language was taken out. But, but we haven't approved the language. I think part of this discussion started in February about the ability to act <coughs> on behalf. No, the, the document that was presented to the board as a part of the Ledge Committee in February included the exact language that Ms. Turner is referring to. And it's at that board meeting that the language was removed, and that's according to the issue that you're talking about. Okay. Um, so we've been talking about it since February. I think the new piece of information that we're <coughs> receiving right now is that <coughs> according to the attorney, we cannot give the ability to act to the legislative committee without noticing any action that may be taken under Bagley Key. I think that's the only thing that we have, in order to move on from this, we well, just have to understand someone, that. Someone in legal approved the original language that was there. So yeah, I don't know how the disconnect is happening now. We're trying to put it back. I mean, maybe we're receiving additional information, mm -hmm. but uh, we're just asking for something that was taken out and I wasn't, there, many of the board members weren't there when it was taken out, but we we need to put it back. Is what we're asking for. So I think, so I think possibly, it, in my mind, yes, the information was correct. I think we've had new information given in that our attorney is now saying because there was mention made of if you have to act within ten days, 
And what his attorney now is saying is that you can't act within 10 days because of the bag and keen over meeting him. So I think probably the advice given before was correct. The advice given now is correct. It's just an, it's, um, expanding upon the knowledge base that we have. I don't know what advice was provided about before, but it, what you're saying is not inconsistent because the language in the pending motion, if it reiterates something that was previously part of the um, authorization of the committee, uh, it doesn't, it can't change or modify statutory law. So uh, the, the only restriction we're talking about here is that the committee would just have to comply with Bagley Keene. So there'd be a 10 day notice period and posting of an agenda there can be discussion and um, action taken if it complies with that. And it requires a 10-day period. Madam Chair, just a point for clarification. Some of our committees are already posting on our website uh, mm -hmm. their meeting agendas, correct? They're posting their meeting agenda. It's, I believe, just the education. I, I, I'd like to say if, if, as long as the <coughs> subcommittee is, is okay with Posting, I think it's actually a benefit to have the requirement to, to post publicly and have public input. It somewhat delays, I think, your concerns that there'd be no, there'd be no mm -hmm. professional uh, input on, on, on mm -hmm. positions. At, at but, the very least, the public would be invited, professionals would attend, and hopefully give their input. So I think that's actually a benefit as opposed to a, anything else. But also, if it's a notice meeting, there could be a public or a professional member added to the team. That's yeah. because that's it's a notice. It's a notice right. meeting. Yes, we can go to a third member. Very good. So, um, again, my only concern is, although it might be rare, we are living. <laughs> in the past two weeks, we have lived the situation mm -hmm. that we may need to act within ten days. So I think the executive committee could probably work that out with legal and executive officer and figure out what our options are because it's a reality of life that, um, that we, I mean, we're living it right now that uh, that may occur. Not frequently, uh, but possibly may occur. And I think uh, Mr. Swenson uh, at least uh, provided maybe one option. And uh, between the executive committee and Mr. Swenson, I'm sure, DCA legal, I'm sure it can be worked out. Any further discussion from the board? A friendly observation, if I may. Um, the AB 1229 and its companion uh, SB, which has not been, this, well, on the docket for a little while, <coughs> we as a board have been discussing sunset for well over two years mm -hmm. and I believe that is really the piece that is in question here and I would believe <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong I could and I'm often wrong but I believe everyone including the members of the legislative and regulations committee Everyone has a sense of an understanding of the board's position and the members of the board present. That said, we could, as a single element, give or direct, I guess is probably the more appropriate, and legal will help me fix my words. We could direct or ask that committee to appear when and if any actions legislatively come to bear between uh, formal board meetings or post-it meetings. Just about that element. Now that said, 
one of the things, at least it's my understanding, that legislative and regulations is also to do, they're supposed to keep us abreast about all legislation. And they themselves just said they're going to try to categorize, that might not have been the word they used, but there's some that will be uh, presented to us as watched or opposed as amended or to support. And it would be our responsibility as a group when they make the reports to give them some direct feedback about what we might want to see happen if that particular piece of legislation is acted upon between meetings, which is a lot different than the actual changing of the directives or the way the committee functions, the language that we are discussing that could make it a m meeting necessary for public hosting. It, it's just a, a third way of looking at things. If you're, I'm not sure if you're referring back to my original objection to authorizing the legislative committee to act on our behalf in the ensuing discussion that we had afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I agree with you there, but, and I also agree that the legislative committee should be watching and reporting to us. So in your instance, I'll just take this one that's on here, SB 227. It's recommended from the legislative and reg regulatory committee that we watch this, but I've had no report. I have no idea what we're watching about vocational nurse feeding tube services neurodegenerative conditions. I would not want the two public members to make a decision on that because we haven't discussed it. I've had no report. That's my concern is that with with giving the legislative committee the authorization to act on our behalf related to that because I've heard nothing about it. Um, well, technically, I'm in agreement with you. <laughs> no. Uh, what I, I'm sorry, please, go ahead. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make one clarification is that we did receive the bills on our CD. Yes. So I, I've reviewed the bills before I came here. So if I had questions, that was, that was the point of yes than asking about them. So on the CD with our documents, all the bills were included. That's correct. We requested you that. requested that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. But we've had no discussion. My point is we, we're not, we haven't had discussion. So um, it's, do you, do you have questions about it? You want to discuss it now? <coughs> I have voiced my concerns about giving the legislative committee the ability to act on behalf of the whole board. It's simply the way that I feel about it. Um, if I have questions about a bill that is being watched, I will raise the question. I'm raising a process question. Um, I don't need to be reminded that the bills came on the CD. I, <laughs> I, I think Ms. Norton's point is uh, well taken and the intent of uh, including the revised language is really simply to advance a position that's already been known and acted upon by the full board, like AB 1229. Any public comment? And, and, I'm sorry. <laughs> Madam Chair. Board members, my name is John Vertito. I am a stakeholder educator. Uh, during the course of the day, been trying to listen to your conversation. I do ask that you speak into the microphone so we can hear you. Thank you. Too many of you are talking away from it, and I cannot track your conversation. And if we're supposed to make help you make an informed decision or give you our support, we need to know what's going on. So I would appreciate very much. You are all given microphones. Please use them. Um, I know Ms. Uh, James Perez is, and the president and Professor um, Bass Martinez are making a con that effort. I would ask that the other board members please 
We're here to support you and to learn, and you are talking about things that are very near and dear to our hearts, especially among the educators on pass rates. In regards to the delegation of authority, be careful with it. We already had one person in a senior position on this board uh, make, a dis uh, make a communication uninformed by the professional that we had to go to Sacramento and fight with another board because they made an uninformed announcement and they tried to use it against us. So that is very, very important that you watch that whoever represents the board, be careful what you say because if it's inaccurate, it will come back, it will try to haunt us, and people will try to use it against this board and against the vocational nurses and psych techs. So if you are considering that delegation, please do so wisely. If you would like our support, then please be able to communicate with us because we're sitting in here trying to listen. And I'm sitting in the back and I can't hear uh, because some people talk like this into the microphone. So please, we are here to support you. We are here to learn from you, but share the information so we can be an actively informed participant to support you when needed. Thank you. Any other public comment? Good. Any other public comment? May I just apologize for not speaking into the mic? And if anything that I said I need to repeat, I'd be happy to. It's very, See, it's very awkward. <laughs> Hello, I wanted to make a comment on Section 2530i. I do urge, um, especially for us schools who are really trying to do a good job by the state of California, that we uh, take a look at the Thank unique. You the unique properties of California and the problems that some of our career schools may be having, including myself, um, from uh, lack of pass rate information. Brandy, can you either pull the mic up? There. Talk right Hopefully you can hear me a little better. Anyways, I urge, uh, of course, we're going to have more public comment later, but I really do feel that we should uh, take a look at that and see in what way career colleges can be assisted instead of continue to be penalized by not having information that they need. Um, it's hard to improve um, when you don't know which student might need assistance, especially at the end. Um, uh, so I really do urge taking a look at that. I understand having standards, but California itself has its own set of unique needs. Um, this being from the size of our state, the, the employment that we need for vocational nursing and that we have career schools. So if we could take a look at all the factors, including um, the length of time that a graduate gets from the beginning of time, that person could take an exam and then harm my pass rates at that point, uh, that, that is difficult for a school that's really by each and every graduate trying to do the best by the state. So if we could please take a look at all factors before we uh, come up with any definitive number. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, further discussion from the board? Yes, uh, j just one item, Madam Chair, and it's really a point of clarification. Suppose that in this uh, section on the first uh, motion, the committee is also authorized by the board to act on legislation and regulations between scheduled board meetings, because there's a period there now. What if we added on matters where a position has been previously taken by the board? Would that help some of the, uh, allay some of the concerns? Any comment on that? Uh, well, well, thank you, Mr. Durking. And I hope everyone can hear me. It's, it's really awkward to talk to him and talk to you at the same time. Um, 
I think that that would help to alleviate my concerns. Um, so yes, thank you for that. So John, if you could repeat that. Yeah, certainly. Uh, the, the sentence now reads, the committee is also authorized by the board to act on legislation and regulations between scheduled board meetings, and then we would include on matters where a position has been previously taken by the board. If that would be, if that language would be acceptable to Ms. Turner? Yes, it would be. So I accept the amendment. Okay. Any other discussion by board? Excuse me, could legal advisors please? That's who I was going to ask. <coughs> so rather than to take, um, ask for approval, well, we could ask for approval report with that amendment, or we could break it down. Um, and then motion by motion by motion. The best procedure would be to uh, have a motion to amend and then a motion on the question, or you have to call the question after that. Okay. Okay, so, so I, I move that we amend the motion to change the language um, for the amended role of the legislative and regulatory committee to read, quote, after the completion of relevant research and analysis, the committee is authorized to recommend to the board a position of support, oppose, or watch, period. The committee is also authorized by the board to act on legislation and regulation between scheduled board meetings on matters where a position has been previously taken by the board, period. Such actions must be reported to and ratified by the full board at the next scheduled board meeting, end quote. Okay. And then do we need to ask for public comment on that afterwards, or can we just go? Is there a second? Oh. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Mm, public comment? Any discussion? Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, any public comment? Hello, my name is Scott Coward. I am a owner of a career school. I don't speak very well in front of groups like this, so I usually stay in the back much better dealing with students than I am dealing with you guys. <laughs> you scare me. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. I probably should have come up earlier with the other groups that came up because what I want to talk about is the pass rate. And what I'm concerned about is that this board will make decisions based on what other states look like and what other states do and not take into consideration what California is. <coughs> the fact that Spanish is not a second language or a third language for us, it's a first language. Our high school graduates are substantially lower than other high school graduates in other states. So the people we are dealing with academically are coming to us substantially lower than other states. And to make a blanket statement about a pass rate, you say you're here for the public and to help them. And our whole goal as schools is to make a good quality nurse. With what I've heard here, you are going to basically obliterate the VN status in the state of California. Because if you try and hold these students to levels they cannot attain, I, I understand we have to have regulations and we have to 
meet those things. But I just hope that when you look at the pass rates and making decisions about pass rates, that you take into consideration the fact of the students that we're dealing with, the population that we're dealing with, the demographics, the economics, and everything that's involved with this. Because to make a, make a blanket coverage like that, you are going to cut out a lot of good LVN students and graduates that are not going to be able to become LVNs because there are going to be no schools in place to educate them. <coughs> They're gonna to have to go to other states to become an LVN, and then you're gonna to have to hope you can get them back here, okay? The economic status here has to play an effect in this. Students go to school for a certain length of time, and you're giving them unlimited time to take the state boards. You're holding schools responsible for that. That's not fair. I mean, it's, it's not, okay? You're not giving schools the information they need to track these students by whether or not they pass or fail the boards. You're not taking into account that these students, because of their economic status, because of their abilities, may not pass the first time. Because just like me coming up in front of you guys, I'm scared to death up here, okay? And so are they when they go to take these boards. No matter how much hand-holding you do as a school, no matter how much you work with these students, no matter how much you talk to them and you help them, the second they step through those doors to take that test, their mind is gone and they are in total panic mode sometimes. And I'm not just talking about a C student, I'm talking about an honor roll student or a valedictorian or a straight A student. Everyone has this. And if you don't take those things into consideration when you look at the pass rate, you are going to literally kill these schools. And you are going to kill any opportunity that a student has in the state of California to become a VN. You know, I've done this for a while. And I've had my ups and downs as a school. And I can tell you right now, we work hard with every student we have but we don't just take the top 1%. We take the C students because we see the potential in them to be good LVNs. I've had a student that failed out of three schools because he was academically challenged with it. He came to my school, he graduated from my school, he stayed every day afterwards practicing and preparing for his state boards. He did pass on the second time. Didn't help me. This same student, the very first day of clinical, his very first day of clinical, the director of the facility came up and wanted to hire him. The family that he worked with wanted him as a private duty person. He was a great LVN, academically, he was poor. Had he been dropped and cut out of everything, we never would have had this person as an LVN. And now he's working as an LVN and taking care of his family and supporting his family and making our profession better. Okay. Those are things I want you guys to think about when you look at pass rates and what you're doing to these schools because I don't think there's a school out here that doesn't care. I really don't. Now, there may be schools out there that don't care, and yes, that's where you need to step in and, and close those schools and take care of business there. But the schools that are trying and the schools that are working and the schools that are busting it need help, not being kicked while we're down. I'm sorry, I, I need to stop. <laughs> But thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you. John Vertito, educator, Carum College in Sacramento. 
In regards to the fixed pass rate, we need to do something to raise this average. We are the lowest in the nation. However, as an educator with over 30 years of experience, we find out that students rise to the occasion set by the instructors, by the school. If we set high standards and we lead the students and teach them, they can achieve. It will take extra work. You have to hold the schools accountable. Too many times we see schools taking shortcuts, entering into contracts and not providing the education that they agreed to provide for a fee. The only method you have to measure that is the pass rate on the first opportunity, whether a student passes or not on their first exam. That's your standard. And that's what I think you need to stand by and go to a fixed rate. It's going to be tough. I admit it. I, what the gentleman before me said, it is going to be tough. But you're looking at the safety of every potential patient of those school, of those students from those schools. It's to them you need to make sure that the safety of every potential patient is given. That California licensee that is a that holds an LVN license is the best in the nation. That's the standard we have to go by. And that's what every educator, director, and hopefully owner in this room is striving to work towards. You raise the bar, we have to raise the bar. And we are going to work to meet it. But remember, your primary, primary focus is the safety of the people that are under our licensee's care. And that's what you have to consider when you make a decision. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. It's not easy. But to do that rule, every NEC here, every education here, needs the data to find out where our weak spots are. To release that information on the cohort is important to us. And I realize we've had support from the board members, but because of HIPAA and privacy rules, we've had roadblocks. I ask that we find a way around, under, over or just tear down the roadblock and give us the information we need to improve our programs. We cannot do it blindly. By giving us that information, it will help us find out where our weak spots are, improve our programs, and increase that pass rate that you're asking us to do. So give us the tools that we need. We know we have your support, but we have to find a way around these roadblocks to overcome and to achieve what we all agree is a better professional psych tech, better professional licensed vocational nurse that is late, if we take that license anywhere in the nation, it'll be highly respected. Help us achieve that by working together and helping tear down these barricades. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment from mm -hmm. the public? We left, okay. So is there any further discussion on the motion to amend? No. So are we doing it one by one? Well, okay. I, I don't know if we, yeah. what did legal suggest, yes. one by one? That's what the attorney yes. says. All so. right. With the current motion on the floor is, after completion of relevant research and analysis, the committee is authorized to recommend to the board a position of support, oppose, or watch. The committee is also authorized by the board to act on legislation and regulations between scheduled board meetings on the matters that a position that has been taken by the full board. Such actions must be reported and ratified by the full board at the next scheduled board meeting. Previously taken. Previously taken. Based on that correction, I second it. And Cheryl was the maker of the motion, and John seconded. Oh, okay, so I, okay, so you made it for me, but all right. Okay, well, I was just repeating it so that we knew what we were voting on. Okay, all right. Sorry, it's okay. So we'll take a roll call vote. Donna, yes. John, yes. Paul, yes. Bernice, yes. Myself is a yes. Samantha, yes. Ken? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Ale Alita? Yes. Motion passes. It was unanimous.
So let's take. <coughs> can can we take the rest of the motions that they put in their report together as a one? So for the the last three motions that was in the committee report to accept. accept the recommendations from the Legislative and Regulations Committee. I so move. Is there any uh, discussion by the board on the rest of the motions? Madam President, just a point of clarification for everyone. It is the understanding of the Education Committee <coughs> That, their, that legislation is asking the committee to gather data, which includes gathering data and hearing stakeholders before we come back with information so that the overall board can make a decision. Okay, any further discussion? Any public comment? Madam President. Yes, Donna. In light of, in, in light of uh, Madam Vice President's concern, I would like to amend the motion on six, on number six, um, to read, the committee requests the Education Committee consider and provide input regarding possible amendment of California Code of Regulations um, 2530 and 2585 to require programs maintain an average annual pass rate at 75 um, and to remove um, and then strike the rest and report back to the full board. The way this motion reads right now, it just it seems like the committee is requesting that the education committee just seek input and then change it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we didn't mean to put in the 75%, although that was the basis for the discussion. We want the Education Committee to come back and give their input. So yes, we would like to delete the annual pass rate of 75%. Huh? Is that? Yes, I, I think that the motion is to just move this to the Education Committee for input and to report back to the board. And to the committee. Yes. So put up here, remove the rest from to require programs. So I, I guess asking? since I made the actual motion, I'm going to have to figure out how to word this. Um, uh, So is the Education Committee being asked to provide a recommendation? To gather information. After, <coughs> after the gathering of information. Right. The committee requests the Education Committee to consider pro and provide input regarding possible amendment to California Code of Regulations. Yeah. To require programs to maintain an average annual pass rate at 75% and to report back. So they. Percentage is up for question too. I think the, the, the intent is to to, to uh, research and yeah. to report yeah. back and to. They can't hear in the. I, I apologize. I'm I'm just pointing out that I think the percentage that's specific, specified in this motion um, maybe ought to be changed. So, possibly. To 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 uh, pass rate uh, <coughs> to be determined because this is part of what they're going to be. Um, um, 
reviewing is, is what is a, a, an adequate standard, an acceptable standard. I agree with you, Paul. I think the way, which is my concern with this motion, is I, I think the motion reads that at the end of the day it's going to be the 75 percent, right. which yeah. is what we need to take out because that is not, I don't believe that is the intent of this. Um, that is being driven right now. We want to look at this and have input from our stakeholders and make a determination after the input. Along, along with the gathering of research right. to determine, uh, to put it into perspective and context. So perhaps we should just have it read, the committee requests the Education Committee consider and provide input regarding possible amendment to the California Code of Regulations, period. <laughs> well, we have to put well, the code regarding, regarding the pass rate. Yes, well, yes, well, regarding well, annual pass rate, yeah. all of that, but I just didn't want to read all those numbers. <laughs> and to rec make a recommendation back to the full board well, they to provide input. Provide input is, <coughs> is recommendation back to the board. Okay, just just a moment. A point procedurally, I believe that the ledge committee is referring it to education for input. Mm -hmm. Led, uh, education then brings the information back to the ledge committee. Ledge committee then proposes it as a change in regulation to the full board for vote. So provide input to ledge committee. Yes. So um, are, are you, again, I'm a process person. So um, within this, and maybe that's the problem with these motions. Um, the motion that we, that we just amended previously gave the ledge committee the authority to act on previously, on positions previously stated. Yes. Under this situation, the full board would not have made any determination about the pass rates because it's going to the education committee and back to the legislative committee. So it would need to come before the full board. Yes. Oh, you're saying you yep. believe that it needs to come before the full board to approve the pass rate, then it comes back to ledge committee to then turn around and then propose it to the full board for vote? I'm just simply saying that any change would need to be approved by the full board, not specifically by the ledge committee. That's what I'm saying. Well, the ledge committee is asking for feedback to help it formulate its motion to the full board. I understand. So, I, so ultimately, we'll go to the full board. I just want to assure that it's coming back to the full board. Oh, yes, of course. I mean, I suppose theoretically the education committee could bring it up to the full board, <coughs> their findings. Yeah. So I, th I think we're making this, I think we all want the same thing at the end of the day. And I think it's just with all these motions and committees, it's becoming a lot, it's becoming a lot more than it, than it needs to be. I think the purpose of this is to have, is to raise the standards and to take a look at whether or not our current pass rates are, are uh, where they should be. The purpose of the board is to make sure that this happens. In what arena that it happens, whether it's, it's kind of odd that it's coming through the legislative and regulatory um, and then going to the education committee. So however we have to word this so that we can move on I'm fine with whether it's putting a period there with just the understanding and, and no more wording I'm, that needs to happen. It's fine with me. <laughs> so, Cheryl, do you wait for me? Okay. So, the committee, okay, let me just try to say this. The committee requests the, the Legislative and Regulation Committee requests the Education Committee consider and provide input regarding possible amendment of code, California Code of Regulations section 2530 for vocational nurses and section 2585L for psychiatric technicians. 
and that they report back after due research and receipt of input from stakeholders a, an annual pass rate. to be added to those regulations. For presentation to the full board. I think that's what she's asking for. Could we not just simply say that the committee requests that the Education Committee consider and provide input regarding possible amendment of California Code of Regulations 2530 and 2585 um, regarding the state's annual pass rates and make a recommendation back. And then we don't, and then we're not getting into what the outcome is going to be. We're just directing them to take a look at the annual pass rates and report back to us. So then you don't need that language related to annual pass rates and reporting back and getting input from the stakeholders. You, you can simply, after the PT, say regarding annual pass rates, pass rate. period. period. Is that your motion, Donna? I'm, I just, I just want to, I just want to be able to take a look at this and, and I, without all the needed language for well, with input okay, from the stakeholders include, and all of that. I, I want to make the oh, language simple yes. with the understanding the direction and then it's going to come back, which is all, what we all want. We all want the same thing here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we can leave out, reach out to stakeholders. I think we need to refer to a fixed, fixed annual pass rate. Okay. okay. Regarding fixed annual pass rate. Period. Period. Okay. Period. Collaboration. Is there a second for the motion? Don't need a second. Uh, I will second the motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none. So we'll do a roll call vote on the motion on the floor made by Cheryl and seconded by Paul. Uh, Donna? Yes. Uh, John? Yes. Paul? Yes. Bernice? Yes. Myself is a yes. Samantha? Yes. Ken? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Al Alita? Yes. The motion carries. The vote was unanimous. Now we need to take the last two or so we have the last two motions from or was that it? I thought there was two. No, there's there's there is two there's number five which is ten. Huh? Which is there is a motion in here, but we don't we need so sorry. <laughs> I don't think we need to act on the other motions. They're in. They're they're backwards, right? They've already happened. So. Huh? For the whole report. For the recommendations. So we're going to call the question on the motion as amended on the report from the Legislative and Regulation Committee. So is there any further discussion? Okay, we're gonna do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Paul? Yes. Bernice? Yes. Myself is a yes. Samantha? Yes. Uh, Ken? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. And keep on yeah. saying Alita. 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 <laughs> yes. Motion carries. Vote was unanimous. Okay. 
So at this point, because the time, at this point, since the time constraint, we're going to do all of the education portions together. So we're going to go take a lunch break. And should we do 30 minutes, be back in 30 minutes or 45? 130? We'll be back together at 130.